allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And before the Seneca representatives leave, um, our board member, uh, Mr. Virch, uh, wanted a moment with them. If anybody's affiliated with Seneca, come on down. If your wife is affiliated with Seneca, come on down. Here's our two seats. Here we are, Braden, come over here. And if you will observe for Braden, the school colors of our Seneca country are yellow and blue. And I want you to know that this school, Seneca, was built in 1966. And gasoline cost only 32 cents. Cost only 32 cents a gallon. The Baltimore Orioles would go on to win their first MLB World Series. My brother would graduate from Kenwood High School. It was a time of tremendous change. Change we still, still address and deal with today. But uh, 10 schools were also opened in 1966. Two of them were duplicates, Powhatan and our Seneca. And you could build a school for $825,000. Today, if you own the land, you're looking at 30 million without even touching the fixtures. But of course, it was 50 years ago. And so these folks are here tonight so that we can celebrate, commemorate 50 years of education excellence <clears throat> in the southeastern part of our county, an area that I grew up in. I'm glad that they're here. It is my pleasure to share with them a gift. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay, okay, oh, whoops. Okay, okay, got it, thanks. <laughs> Is, can, you, can you hold this for me, Braden? Oh, no, the microphone. Oh, no, first you're gonna hand me back the vase. Thank you, thank you. This beautiful vase of flowers of yellow and blue, symbolizing the colors of our proud Seneca Elementary School. It is my pleasure as your sixth Sir, district Sir, representative Sir, on the Sir, Board of Education to present these it. flowers to the future of our greater <coughs> community and our county. Marissa, on behalf of our <laughs> Seneca Elementary School, I ask that you accept these. <coughs> Joining us is also a former principal who is now our chief academic officer, Marilena White. Is there anything that you'd like to say as I hand these to you? Um, first, you have to take this first. Here, I'll hold the mic for you. <laughs> you I don't want you to drop them. Here you go. Oh, 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 turn this way. That's right, two hands. Oh, I'll give you help with that. Okay. Um, nothing. <laughs> oh, you're most welcome. Very good. Ladies and gentlemen, representatives of our Seneca Elementary School, 50 years of education excellence, and we're fortunate to have a former principal, the current principal, our assistant principal, the PTA head, our students with us. <coughs> Mr. Birch does two shows tomorrow, so if either one, anybody wants to. <laughs> and, if the the and if the flowers <laughs> arrive like they're supposed to, we'll get them down there because on the 19th, they're having a celebration at our Seneca Elementary School. And if I may be so bold, you're all invited to come. Thank you ever so much. Outstanding. Oh, don't drop those. All right, the next item on our agenda is consideration of the agenda. Ms. Uh, Dr. Dancer, are there any additions or changes? Um, I would ask that we remove item G uh, from tonight's agenda. Uh, no, item G is obviously our, um, our student members' comments, and she is not here this evening. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Very good, thank you. The next item on our agenda is selection of speakers. Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Uh, board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed on the box to my right, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers. Number one is Greg Dildine. 
second speaker is Bash Farone. <coughs> Third speaker is Marion Moore. <coughs> Fourth speaker is Diana Bergman. Fifth. Fifth speaker, thank you, is Paul Mercier. Sixth speaker is Julie Aber. Seventh speaker is Kirby Spencer. Eighth speaker is Charlotte Brooks, and I believe that is it. Very good. <coughs> Next on our agenda is um, the superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair, <laughs> members of the board. Um, as we look at the calendar, we have less than five weeks left to go in the school year, and this kicks off our season uh, of celebration. And so the first celebration I would like to uh, recognize is uh, Verlita White, who's our chief academic officer, along with Ryan Abriali, executive director of Innovative Learning, and Fran Glick, our coordinator for digital learning, because Baltimore County Public Schools was most recently recognized as having the best library program in the country. And so we are the 2017 National School Library Program of the Year, announced by the American Association of school librarians. So we can give ourselves a round of applause for that. Baltimore County has been working over the last five years to make sure we rebrand the role of the school library media specialist. And under Fran's leadership, we've done a really good job of rebranding that role where our library media specialists are working with students as we look to have personalized learning environments in all of our schools. Congratulations to you, uh, Ms. White, Mr. Embriali, and of course, Fran Glick, um, for your energy, enthusiasm, and your leadership. Continuing with our celebrations, we announced our teacher and our principals of the year um, for the 2017-2018 school year. Uh, last week, we announced, I should say two weeks ago, we announced that Rebecca Ike, a uh, grade two teacher from Owings Mills Elementary School, is our teacher of the year, and we'll be recognizing her <coughs> along with MSDE next week with a luncheon uh, downtown. Cheryl Brooks from Berkshire Elementary School, and all of us are familiar uh, with Ms. Brooks um, as our elementary principal of the year, and Aubrey Brown, who's the principal of Randallstown High School, as our secondary principal of the year. So as we begin the season of celebrations, it will culminate um, with the graduation ceremonies Tuesday, May 30th through Friday, June 9th, when we recognize all of our students as the graduating class of 2017. And so congratulations to all of our students, all of our teachers who are receiving awards, our administrators who are receiving awards for a job well done over the course of the 2016 2017 school year. Um, my last comment tonight, of course, talks about high school. And as we've looked at calculating our high school hours along with uh, the State Department, high schools will join elementary schools and middle schools in closing three hours early on the last day of school, which is Tuesday, June the 13th. That was originally scheduled to be a full day for high school students. However, in calculating our hours, we're able to uh, close half day and allow our teachers some additional time to close out the school year on June the 13th only for high schools. Um, and so with that, Mr. Chair, that concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you, Dr. Dance. Next on the agenda is the chair's report. Uh, a lot has transpired since the board last met on April 18th. Importantly, the board is addressing uh, the interim superintendent search. Uh, we are certain that the transition from Dr. Dance's superintendency uh, to an interim superintendent uh, will be as smooth as possible. Uh, BCPS is more than one person. Uh, BCPS is more than one superintendent, and BCPS is more than any one board member. Uh, now, more than ever, we need to be focused on preparing over 112,000 students for success in an environment of technology and rapid change. Um, and we cannot <coughs> succeed uh, using yesterday's models and methodologies. Innovation must continue. And in a system as diverse as ours, diverse geographically, demographically, socially, ethnically, uh, we must continue ha to have equity uh, as our constant focus. Uh, these are big picture matters, uh, but on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, there are much uh, uh, wonderful things to look at through a, a smaller lens. Um, uh, the day-to-day -day successes remind us of the fact that the big picture course must march forward. Uh, last week, for instance, on May 3, uh, Carver student Joey Riceberg recited his original poetry at the annual Common Sense Awards con um, uh, ceremony in Washington, D.C. Award recipients that night included United States Senator Susan Collins, a Republican from Maine, United States Senator Maggie Hassan, a Democrat from New Hampshire, 
and our own Dr. Dallas Dance. Common Sense is a not-for-profit focused on making the media and technology world a better place for children. Um, we also have had uh, the fantastic Teacher of the Year and Principals of the Year ceremonies on April 26, and many of you uh, joined me and my fellow board member Steve Virch at the Baltimore Museum of Art on April 30th uh, for Art is for Everyone, an exhibition of student art in a museum setting. And in just three weeks, uh, our proud seniors will begin marching across the stage as graduation of BCPS uh, begins. Um, they're going to be ready to address their career and college choices. There's so much to celebrate and so much to look forward to, uh, and I look forward to moving the Baltimore County Public Schools forward. Next on our agenda is public comment, and first we have uh, the advisory and stakeholder groups. Uh, our first speaker is uh, TABCO's representative, Abby Baton. <coughs> We have a little over a month left in the school year, and thank you for, for uh, allowing the high schools to close three hours early. That was our request, and we appreciate it, and our high school teachers appreciate it. So for the first time in many years, we are not short hours, which is a good thing, and this will allow our teachers some much needed time to close out the year, so thank you. We know you are facing one of the most important decisions you will make as a Board of Education selecting an interim superintendent. Our request is simple. We have provided a list of some of the essential qualities necessary in a highly effective superintendent. These are the must-haves for the incoming interim. According to the former superintendent of Baltimore County Public Schools, Robert DeBell, and our current superintendent, Dr. Dallas Dance, a superintendent must first and foremost understand the most important part of the job of the superintendent is to support teachers in the classroom. So thank you for that. Classroom experience, strong integrity, able to collaborate and work with all stakeholders, a proponent of public education, understand and have the ability to work with a diverse workforce, student body and community, believe and support equity, understand and be familiar with collective bargaining, and maybe almost the most important, surround himself or herself with people who are willing to tell the superintendent what he or she needs to hear, not what that person thinks he or she wants to hear. So if you are able to find someone with these characteristics, we will indeed be well served in Baltimore <coughs> County Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baton. Our next speaker is from the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, and that's Megan Stewart-Sicking. Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairwoman Johnson, Dr. Dance, and members of the board, good evening to all of you. As I begin, I'd like to also acknowledge Mr. Virch um, and thank him for coming to our one of our most recent meetings on um, struggling readers. And I thank all of you who made time to come to one of our meetings this year. We very much appreciate it. Over this past year, two issues have been our constant refrain, struggling readers and staffing. While we will continue to discuss those, in the next year we will be adding two new topics to our refrain, behavior and autism. Tonight I want to briefly address three upcoming contracts that involve behavior and autism. <coughs> First, in the next few weeks you will be considering a contract for crisis prevention and intervention. We know that behavior is an issue in our schools and more staff training is needed. It is critical that staff are trained to reduce anxiety and diffuse hostile, hostile or violent behavior. CPI strategies teach what staff might do to help youth who are aggressive, who act out in stress, who consistently make poor decisions, who are involved in destructive peer relationships, or those who lack social skills to be successful. We hope you will support this contract for crisis prevention and intervention. Two contracts regarding autism will be considered in the next few weeks. One is geared toward birth to five, and the other benefits the elementary and secondary levels. 
We know that over the past five years, the fastest growing special ed population within BCPS is students on the autism spectrum. Our early intervention staff is not supported nearly enough in learning strategies to improve outcomes for our youngest students with autism. This contract begins to offer more education and continued coaching in everything from prompt hierarchy and principles of reinforcement to data collection and data-based decision making. This level of training combined with evidence-based strategies can improve outcomes for our students with autism. Regarding the contract for elementary and secondary levels, resources and instructional strategies will benefit teachers, paraeducators, and potentially additional adult assistants, all of whom are often unprepared and completely under-supported for dealing with students on the autism spectrum. In my three minutes here, I can barely begin to tell you how important these concepts are and how much we need to do to prepare for this population that continues to grow in our schools. We urge you to approve both contracts and hope that they will help us better meet the needs of students on the autism spectrum and improve long-term outcomes within our system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the Educational Support Professionals of Baltimore County, and that's Lila Marinbloom. <clears throat> Good evening, Dr. Dance and Baltimore County Board of Education members. I'm Lila Marenbloom, and I represent the Educational Support Professionals of Baltimore County. I'm here to talk to you about Kronos. Kronos is a timekeeping system that utilizes a time clock. Every employee has an ID card with a barcode on it. Educational support uh, personnel use this ID to swipe in at the beginning of the workday and swipe out at the end of the workday. The problem educational support staff have with the system is that we also need to swipe in and out again for our lunch break. Classroom-based support staff in particular are having a prop, a very hard time with this. The time clock is kept in the main office. <coughs> In many schools, it can be as long as 10 minutes to get from one's workstation back to the office to swipe out for lunch. It can take as long as another 10 minutes to get back to the lunchroom. Needless to say, it can take another 10 minutes from there um, to, fi um, to finish eating and get back to swipe back in again. Our people are just not getting that uninterrupted 30-minute lunch break that our master agreement guarantees. Does their lunch break start from the swipe out or 10 minutes later when they finally get to the lunchroom? The duty-free lunch starts when we sit down to eat lunch, even if it did take 10 minutes to get there. Most of our members cut their lunches short so that they can swipe in exactly 30 minutes after having swiped out. Our members aren't paid overtime for cutting their lunches short, but are docked for not swiping in within the 30 minute time period. The justification for the swipe in and swipe out for lunch is to guarantee that our members get a duty free lunch. This isn't happening. The opposite is happening. We did have a meeting with the Kronos committee and presented them with more than 50 pages of our members testimony on how this isn't happening. We need a remedy to this situation. <coughs> I am asking that the swiping out for lunch and then back in after lunch be discontinued. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the Citizens Advisory Committee for Gifted and Talented Education. That is Julie miller breeds <coughs> Good 
Good evening, Chairman Gillis, board members, Dr. Dance, and the BCPS community. Before anything else, I would like to extend my sincere best wishes to Dr. Dance and the hope for a great future for him. The GTCAC has very much appreciated the conversations we've had over the last several years. We've been able to discuss many issues central to having an excellent gifted and talented program in place, and we have seen some movement in some areas. In the current proposed operating budget for fiscal year 2018, for example, BCPS has added four positions in the home and hospital program to help support advanced students. The GTCAC has been pursuing this for the last several years and are gratified that students in GT and AP classes who are suffering from issues that keep them out of school will now be able to receive the teaching support they need at a level that is appropriate for them. We've also heard that BCPS will be looking into the possibility of providing extra duty pay for the GT facilitators that exist in every and which is something that the GTCAC has explicitly asked for. We are very hopeful to see money to fund that in the next operating budget. One thing we haven't seen, however, is any change in the proposed operating budget for the Office of Advanced Academics, which has remained fairly stagnant over the last several years. In fiscal year 2014, approximately 0.17% of the operating budget went to the Office of Advanced Academics, while in the proposed operating budget for fiscal year 2018, the office will see about a 0.2% of the overall budget. What this means is the Office of Advanced Academics receives about one five hundredth of the overall budget, which doesn't seem to return very much to the 30.4% of the students across BCPS in grades 6 through 12 who received GT services in the 2015-16 school year, which is the most recent year we have data on. The 30.4% of the student population does not even include students who access advanced academics in elementary school as BCPS does not yet have a way to capture students as they flow in and out of the accelerated pathways that occur in the elementary grades. Our recommendation, BCPS needs to staff a high school resource teacher to address the issues related to advanced learners at this level. Currently, the office has three resource teachers who work primarily with elementary schools and one resource teacher who works primarily <coughs> with middle and high schools. Having a dedicated high school resource teacher would allow for instructional coaching and support for teachers of GT and AP courses integration of educational options such as dual enrollment and e-learning into the traditional course sequence for advanced students, expanding the availability of dual enrollment to include additional colleges and universities, collaboration with academic offices to write curriculum tailored to the needs of advanced learners, providing support to high school teachers to effectively leverage the digital conversion for high school students as those devices are rolled out, and assisting with the total workload of the office which is responsible for curriculum, professional learning, acceleration requests, placement appeals, support to teachers in schools, outreach to community, development of resources for all schools K through 12 and BCPS, and approximately 30,000 plus students who are accessing advanced programs and services. Some level. Thank you. <laughs> well done. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Our next speaker from CASE is Bill Lawrence. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Gillis, Ms. Johnson, Dr. Dance, always a pleasure. Um, a couple of things. Uh, first is the official uh, announcement of my retirement uh, as executive director of CASE. Uh, applause is not necessary uh, at, at this moment. Uh, but thanks you to those of, of you who have contacted me and wished me well uh, in, my, in my leaving. Uh, who fills my job, uh, rumors is, have, has actually been replaced in the what do you hear uh, in the schools with uh, who's going to be the next superintendent. Uh, as to the who's going to replace me, just for your information, uh, uh, on our website uh, is a timeline that outlines uh, the search process, <coughs> interview process, uh, and the timeline by which we hope my board uh, hopes to uh, fill the position and I can play a little more golf and uh, go back to Cape Cod for a little while. Anyway, uh, but I, I, I commend the uh, website to you as a template uh, because right now you don't have time for an open process. Uh, it would be nice if you could scour the universe and uh, bring in you know, stakeholder groups and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, you don't have that kind of time. You have to find an interim superintendent uh, quickly. Um, what I suggest, since 
over the years, I seem to be here a lot telling you how to do your jobs. Um, open the timeline. Let people know where you are, where you hope to be. Um, you, you've got my members, 565 or so, uh, building administrators, <coughs> assistant principals, uh, central office staff, who are filling jobs, who are designing curriculum, who are working on summer workshops, who are doing a whole host of things because, as Mr. Gillis said, the big picture, the, the, the school system has to keep has to keep grinding. We can't you know, pull over to the side of the road and wait for somebody to get in the driver's seat. Um, there are 18,000 of your employees uh, who are waiting for you. And to the extent that you can bring them a picture, not a decision, but a picture of how we're going to get to filling Dr. Dance's <coughs> job would be extremely helpful uh, out in the world. Because Way too much time, by the way, uh, is being spent with people asking, what do you hear, what do you hear, what do you hear? So I would give for your uh, consideration uh, Supreme Court Justice Marshall's uh, directive in 1954. <laughs> All deliberate speak. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker from the Area Education Advisory Council's central area is Amy Freeman. Good evening, board members, and thank you for this opportunity to speak on behalf of the Central Area Education Advisory Council. I come to you tonight to continue the plea for a comprehensive, system-wide, physical facilities plan to address school facility needs that persist across Baltimore County. In the executive summary of the physical facilities assessment from December of 2014, it states, <laughs> The system-wide facil <coughs> physical facilities assessment establishes data to equip BCPS to move from a reactionary mode to a proactive mode with a clear vision of the future, 2014. The data are there. The information that you need has been collected, bought and paid for with tax dollars, but to what end? Nearly two and a half years after this assessment was done, it appears as though we are even farther away from making this shift from reactionary to proactive mode as there is no long-term system-wide plan. There's not even a plan for individual schools whose needs you have been made aware of for years. For Towson High School, consistently the most overcrowded high school in Baltimore County, with continued increasing enrollment projected, there is no plan. For Ridgely Middle School, consistently the most overcrowded middle school in Baltimore County, with continued increasing enrollment projected, <clears throat> there is no plan. There are schools throughout Baltimore County, buildings that house children every day that are wholly inadequate, that have no plan in place. This is not acceptable. Something has to be done. Thank you. Our next speaker from the Northeast Area Advisory is Heather Bergen. Hello. Good evening. Hello. Good evening. On behalf of the Northeast Area Advisory Council, I would like to say thank you and that we are grateful for the design funding for a new Northeast Area Middle School. We anxiously await news on the chosen location and look forward to breaking ground. In the meantime, unfortunately, we still have a problem for the next four years, assuming the planning and construction moves forward as promised. Four years is a long time to wait for relief for Perry Hall Middle School. The issue cannot be ignored any longer. And we feel that the recommendations that are gonna be presented this evening are disappointing, inadequate, and unacceptable. The projections for Perry Hall Middle School are dismal. I'll hold this up so you all can see. Perry Hall Middle School has a state rated capacity of 1,643. Current enrollment is 1,845. Future projections for next year, 1,958. The following year, 2,000. 
and 75, at which time Perry Hall Middle School will have the dubious distinction of being the largest school in Baltimore County. We will surpass Perry Hall High School. We'll be number one, and not in a good way. The next year, Perry Hall Middle School is still the largest school in the county, and then the year after that, 2020 to 2021, will fall back behind Perry Hall Middle, according to the current projections. We understand that implementing relief strategies may be a difficult process, but so is being a student at Perry Hall Middle School with over 2,000 students. After years of neglect of this issue, it can no longer be ignored. Some possible suggestions for relief strategies are to ask for volunteer transfers to schools that are underutilized and streamline the special transfer process and offer priority placements to those that volunteer. Offer priority placements to magnet schools for all Perry Hall Middle School students. Enact annexing to Kearney, Oakley, Pine Grove, and Vincent Farm Elementary Schools so that they no longer feed into Perry Hall Middle School to utilize the over 500 empty available seats at Pine Grove Middle and Middle River Middle Schools. If the boundary measures fail to provide, I'm sorry, if the above measures fail to provide adequate relief, enact emergency boundary changes to keep the enrollment closer to state rated capacity. In closing, I'd like to read a quote from Beverly German, which was posted on the Perry Hall Middle School PTSA Facebook page on this issue. <coughs> Our Perry Hall kids deserve the same physical space, academic program, and safe and secure learning environment as every other student in the system. What concrete measures will be given to our kids to ensure learning and safety? It goes way beyond more trailers, relocatable classrooms. In closing, relief measures are long overdue. We need something to happen now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now it's time for public comment. Our first speaker is Greg Dildine. Did I get that right, Greg? That is right. Thank you, Chairman Gillis, and uh, members of the board, and Dr. Dance, and thank you for your service and best wishes to you, Dr. Dance. Uh, members, you've heard from a few of us before, but I'm one of um, who I believe to be many uh, Towson High School <coughs> stakeholders in greater Towson High School area. Um, so not just students of Towson High, but the communities and uh, those with children and without children that may send their kids there um, currently and into the future. You've heard from a few of us before, but I, and I believe you'll be hearing from more of us. Uh, we know that there's a lot of planning to do. You've just heard from, from other folks around the county and, and certainly my <coughs> colleague in the neighborhood and in PTA matters, Amy Freeman, who spoke from the central area address the county as a whole. So we obviously realize we're not here uh, in isolation and that it's a, a big picture kind of ask to do this kind of planning that's uh, gonna be beyond uh, some of your terms and, and, and beyond uh, the, the superintendent's role uh, to help us with these planning <coughs> roles. So we're just asking to be included, the stakeholders. Uh, I'm, on, I'm on the PTA at Stoneley Elementary, on the PTA at the high school, and we'll be on the PTA at Dumbarton Middle next year. So I've access to and privilege to hear from, from parents and stakeholders. Also, the stakeholders, like I mentioned, that are homeowners, but perhaps without children, um, as, as privileged to be rep a representative of the Stoneley Community Association over the last few years, I can also hear and, and have heard from those folks. So we're really just looking to collaborate and look for these creative solutions that you and, and people way smarter than, than us uh, can come up with for the needs at Towson High School. And we're not talking about the academic uh, needs. These are more physical, as you all know. When I was lucky to attend Dr. Dance's annual State of the uh, Schools last year, uh, not even just this year, but the year, year prior, uh, hearing of how much growth there is, uh, the capacity and the overcapacity issues that we face it at the high school. I also got to hear the reports from previous years, going back several, about how the physical structure has its, has its woes as, again, we're not the only ones. So you'll probably hear from more of us. Uh, it's a, a long-term process, so we appreciate uh, the collaboration and, and your patience to listening to us uh, because it's a, a team effort. So we thank you for your support and, and, and look forward to, to working, even, but maybe even sooner than later, even though it is a long road, with the uh, budget planning <coughs> process uh, that I'm aware of that even for fiscal year 19, is happening now and, and comes up 
for debate in the capital projects uh, and discussion, at least, and the capital projects planning at the May, th uh, May 25th meeting, I believe, right? May 23rd. Uh, so I appreciate any help with that kind of planning and planning money if needed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is <laughs> Bosch Tarone. Mr. Chairman, this is a symbolic gift for Dr. Gans, and the cost is less than $20, according <laughs> to the ethics rules. Thank you, Dr. Dance, for your service. <coughs> I hope you're not leaving us because of me. <laughs> <laughs> However, honestly, I think wherever you go, I hope you run for a county executive or a governor. I really do. Or something similar. So um, I heard today about equity, equality, again, as I heard it for almost 20 years. I think uh, the next superintendent uh, needs to equally work on our buildings, air conditioners, and also on our computers, tablets, etc. And of course, on improving the curriculum altogether. And I know teachers do inspire the students. That's really important part. However, I really <coughs> hope the next superintendent and the teachers will inspire the love of the First Amendment. The First Amendment. No discrimination based on religion, and of course, freedom of speech. So for 22 years, I have been lobbying the board for equal holidays. It has been a political perk in 1995, and continues to be. And I hope this board would not really continue the status quo. Uh, closing the schools, I think every day is worth about $3 million, I believe. So closing the schools on Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah for 22 years, that really adds almost to $132 million. And it's advertisement for one group over others. That's unfair. If we continue the same practice, we should not utter the word equity anymore or equality. We should not. And I really hope this board would listen to me after 22 years of appealing to you. <coughs> um, I, I really thank you, Dr. Dance, very much for all what you have done. You are the fourth superintendent I work with or met or listened to. And you made this school is so much better so much better. I really appreciate everything you have done. <clears throat> I know you have critics. No one is perfect. But I truly will miss you. The people who I represent will miss you. I think there are many people who would miss you, and I hope that superintendent would be one from the ones behind me, from inside and not really outside. I hope the board, the board would really select people from the talent that we have and not really have somebody from the outside. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Front. Our next speaker is Marion Moore. Good evening, education leaders. This is just a recap of some of the policies that you all were talking about last meeting, policy 1275, 55, 50, 55, 60. <coughs> Policy 1270 focuses on uh, a federal mandate to annually collaborate with parents, uh, education leaders, and students in Title I schools, which means that even though this demographic may not uh, pay property tax, uh, that, uh, or let me, let me try to say this, in those areas, of course, there may be some people that are not contributing to the economy the way other people are in certain zip codes, but that does not 
count, it shouldn't count those people out, okay? So that means that we should consider that these individuals with an open mind can contribute to our economy in the future if we invest in them today. So uh, please keep in, keep in mind that for 1270. So it's, it's a very important policy, and I think that you should uh, consider those things that I just said. So for 55, 50, and 60, uh, last meeting I mentioned, you know, think about some of the things that your children have done at home that wasn't necessarily uh, something to brag about, you know, they may have misbehaved, they may have um, hurt their siblings, but you know, how did, what was your approach? You know, did, did you call the police on your children? <laughs> did you slam them on the floor? Or did you try to figure out what was the root cause for the behavior and how can you modify the way that you parent in order to accommodate your child, and I feel that should be the same approach when uh, you are dealing with or um, relating to your students. In particular, 5560, I have a concern about African Americans and Hispanic students as it relates to special education and the misdiagnosis of ADHD. Just because uh, students are very social or talkative, active learners does not mean that they have this disorder. And that means if you think about it, yes, the school system is in connection to uh, distributing uh, <coughs> drugs to African Americans and Hispanic children, which can uh, relate to uh, their future as dr drug addicts. Thank you. Our next speaker is Diana Bergman. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. Um, my name is Diana Bergman. And today I'm gonna to talk about something in the most humble way over a very sensitive subject. Um, it's about a resolution of restraint and seclusion. Um, I shared earlier National's PTA stand on a resolution for restraint and seclusion. So he could pass out with every, you know, to every board member. My big request today is restraint and seclusion is something that should have an entitled to its own policy. I shouldn't be mixed in with the vocabulary of a disciplinary policy. Um, the state has a statute, um, Comar 13A.08.04.05, and it details an explanation of what a restraint is, mechanical restraint is, and seclusion is. What you are allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do. I have talked to Mr. Virch, Ms. Johnson, and I'm sorry, Kath. Um, Kathleen, I didn't get a chance to talk to you. But I don't know what the process is to request <coughs> on how to create a new policy. So I know we can't stop the car and pull over. We gotta keep going. And I know I miss Ms. Williams. Um, but this is something that needs to be addressed. It's regarding the safety and the emotional well-being of children. And not just children, but you have the contract that was spoken about earlier that's coming up for C CRP. It's very important to focus on de-escalating a situation to avoid seclusion on a child. They go into this natural defense mode, and it leads to a decision of educators that are trained to do a restraint. So you impact not only the child, you also impact that teacher um, when they have to do their first restraint on a child. They don't feel great about that situation, neither does the child, they feel confused. And as a parent, we have the right to know and understand visually to be able to read the process of what's expected during a situation like this. Um, I hope something positive could really come out of this. 
And the last piece that I have to share is with Nick is a copy of the Comar, a regulation on restraining seclusion. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Our next speaker is Paul Mercier. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, board members, thank you. I'm here speaking on behalf of uh, Towson High School. We've got several families behind me, uh, many of them wearing maroon, uh, along with their children, future students of Towson High School, 20, 25, and beyond. Um, our goal uh, this evening is, is to ask for your uh, assistance in putting Towson High School in the planning process on May 24th uh, to receive money towards planning. Towson High School, as you know, is, is one of the oldest in the country. Uh, by 2022, uh, the, the year that we're uh, aiming for a new school, it'll be 73 years old. Uh, current enrollment is uh, almost 120% over uh, enrolled there at Towson High. Uh, by 2021, the, the county's own projections put it at 137, 137%. Um, the way the community's growing, we could assume that it would be perhaps even be higher than that. Uh, imagine this room here at full capacity and add another 40%. Uh, it'd be pretty crowded. And what that brings me to is, is, is safety, uh, the safety of the children. I'm told today at 119%, kids are missing the bus because they can't get through the hallways quick enough. So the, the, the narrow hallways and the number of students. Imagine that at 140% with a fire or God forbid, an active shooter scenario. We have to put politics aside and look after the safety of our children. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just a few moments ago, you, you said uh, innovation must continue. It's difficult to continue that in a school 73 years old that just can't support uh, the infrastructure required for new technologies. Uh, the school as it is now, uh, the water raises in the, in the, in the uh, first floor level nearly to the electrical panels, the junction panels. Uh, that's a safety issue that no child should be exposed to. Um, I, would, I would imagine everybody in this room would agree that that's a, a pretty drastic uh, and needs to be repaired. Obviously, the, the school uh, was renovated in 1999, uh, inadequately so. Um, the school is, is, is failing. It, it, your own report to the 2014 assessment states corrosion is evident in the electrical system. Uh, that just can't continue, and it goes, and goes back to the technology that uh, Chairman Gillis uh, kind of inferred to earlier. Um, like I said, the safety of our, our children needs to be put first. We ask that on May 24th, uh, you put Towson High School uh, in the planning process to look at uh, a, a new facility. Um, we know uh, the students and the, the staff at Towson High do an amazing job. Uh, Dr. Dance, I'm sure you're aware, Towson High is in the top about 2.5% in the country academically. Uh, so the students and the teachers are doing their part. Now it's time for this board, the county council, and the state to do their part and take care of our children. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Julie Aber. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm here also with Towson High School requesting planning money in the fiscal year budget 19. As a Baltimore County public school parent of a second grader and a fourth grader and a Towson community member, <coughs> I'm, requ I'm respectfully requesting planning money to be included in the fiscal year 19 <coughs> budget. My husband and I, like so many other young families, spent years trying to find the right house and community for our family. Our decision was solely based on providing our children high quality public education with diversity, academic excellence, access to technology, and the ability to walk to assigned elementary, middle, and high school. We never take for granted that how fortunate we are to be a Baltimore County public <coughs> school family. That being said, our children deserve to learn in a facility that is safe and conducive to successful learning. More importantly, they need to be in a structure that is safe and does not put them in physical harm's way. We are pleased to hear about Northeast Re the Northeast region's recent approval for a new middle school and high school. They are currently 102% over capacity 
and projected to be 106% over capacity with plans to build for 400 additional seats that are yet to be filled. Yay for them, congratulations. But now let's draw attention to Towson High School. The building is currently at 120% overcrowded and is climbing rapidly to 138 to 137 to 138% in the next five years. <coughs> no other high school comes close to Towson's overcrowding problems. Towson High School is 68 years old, the oldest high school in the county. The question has been raised, renovation or rebuild? Renovation on a soon to be 70 year old building that was designed to be built to the last 50 years is very ex a very expensive patch <coughs> and does not solve the problem of the aging infrastructure and size. Towson needs a new building. It's time for our schools to catch up to the 21st century. When it comes to physical condition of the building structure, Towson High School is third worst physical structure by the county's own assessment. Out of the five worst high school structural conditions, Towson High School still has not slotted for rebuild. There is standing water in the first floor after a heavy rain, crumbling foundation walls, exposed electrical <coughs> um, work, uh, fail falling ceilings, mold, and more. Our children spend the majority of their waking hours in that building. If this was your home or workplace, it would be deemed uninhabitable or unworkable. Why are we allowing our children to be exposed to these conditions? They deserve to learn in a safe, enriching environment. New in 22, we ask. Our ne next speaker is Kirby Spencer. <clears throat> hello, hello, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for uh, letting us come tonight. Um, good evening, my name's Kirby Spencer. I'm here on a little different matter. Um, I'm <coughs> Vice President of the Baltimore County Arts Guild, and we are the um, arts countywide organization bringing uh, our goal of bringing the arts home uh, close to everyone's community. Um, aside to that, we are really lucky to have one of your uh, uh, past um, employees, Linda Pop, has recently joined our organization on the board, nationally recognized as an art uh, educator, and uh, has a um, has come on board and is a great asset. But I'm here this evening to introduce a concept that's opposite of Towson. Uh, and I, my heart goes out to them because we've recently experienced that in the Southwest area in the school systems, which you all have really accommodated of, of late. But we're here to talk about um, the idea and the concept of collaboration um, with Baltimore County and the excellence of creativity and problem solving, which is what is done through Baltimore County and public schools. And a proven success strategy for this that we'd like to see implemented throughout the county is actually an arts and entertainment district. And we are currently working with um, uh, groups and organizations, businesses, <coughs> and we see that this can be an asset to the communities in different parts of the county, um, from economic development, uh, revenue generation of arts programs, um, that would obviously benefit the uh, community at large. There's currently 24 arts and entertainment districts throughout the state of Maryland, and there are none in Baltimore County. The Guild is, um, the Guild's Art and Entertainment Council is currently reviewing multiple sites throughout the county with this concept that will flourish. And then the Arbutus Catonsville area in the Southwest Dis District is already um, acknowledged as a very viable uh, site. Essential to the success of an arts and entertainment district is an anchor site. And the location, a building that is which currently vacant, um, recognized to be a focal point for the community would be the old Catonsville Elementary School on Frederick Road. We see this as an opportunity to uh, enhance the programs that are offered through the school programs, but also to uh, bring a, a foundation of art to the community. And this would be just the first. Um, we have in the county guild, the uh, Greater Chamber of 
Commerce from Catonsville, UMBC, local and state officials are all working diligently with the Maryland State Art Council to bring this concept to fruition. That's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thank you so much. Very good. Our last speaker is Charlotte Brooks. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you all, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Miss Johnson, Dr. Dance and the Board of Education of Baltimore County for giving us the opportunity to come and speak to you tonight about a program that we feel very strongly about. And uh, I'm, a, I'm here representing the friends of the former Catonsville Elementary School, many of you, many of whom may have emailed you or tried to reach you in some way about what we are hoping to do um, as a collaborative effort, just as our first speaker tonight had, said about trying to get the community together, the people who are working so hard in nonprofits and a variety of different ways, culturally, economically, uh, helping people learn how to read better, and so um, in the arts, uh, in recreation programs, and in all of these ways that we build the character of young people, and we use the school that was for, has been for 107 years, full-time a school, and is still in really very good condition to actually develop programs cooperatively in the community with the county and with the school system to create a center for cultural enrichment for our community. Um, I'm going to show you this poster that we had a we made up just to remind you of what the school looks like. It's a classic building and it's on the National Road in Catonsville that has been there for 107 years. Um, the guiding principles that we that were developed on a previous task force about the school system was to preserve the Catonsville heritage by re Maintaining the building and developing an attractive and accessible pedestrian site. Um, as you know, Bal Catonsville is a small town, and a lot of people have been through this school. <laughs> Grandchildren, uh, children, uh, parents, and uh, um, even great-grandchildren. I mean, even great-grandparents have been through this school. So we have a great site. We're looking for to further the physical education and spiritual development of our community, as well as analyze costs and benefits and of potential courses of actions and creating a community gathering place. Um, our community stakeholders are Baltimore County Arts Guild, who've been doing a great amount of work that's very close to Arbutus. Um, Turning Pages, which is a reading program to help people who've been incarcerated work with their children on reading. Um, the Catonsville Emergency Assistance Program, which reaches out to families that need help uh, with food. The Baltimore County Parks and Recreation, which has a fabulous program of physical education. Thank you so much, and I apologize for coming from this condition. I have had emergency surgery. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next on our agenda is uh, uh, item I, and it concerns policies. And for that, I invite uh, Mrs. Johnson to speak. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the board. The Board of Education's Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept the committee's recommendations concerning amendments to board policy 1270. These amendments are presented to you on tonight's board's board agenda, Exhibit I. The committee rec considered public com comments received at the board's April 18th meeting. Thank you. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the board's policy review committee? So moved. There's no need for a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 I wanted to make a comment. All right. Ms. I'm sorry, Ms. Causey. I should have asked for comment. Ms. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would just like to say that I think that this policy is incredibly important and that as a board and as a school system, um, as we've heard from stakeholders tonight, that we need to do a much better job in not just giving a few minutes here to listen, 
but to actually really collaborate with our stakeholders, <coughs> many of whom have spent decades involved in this system, not only as parents and teachers and administrators, um, but as, as community stakeholders, as uh, business uh, people in the community, other nonprofit organizations that are trying to help Baltimore County and Baltimore County Public School be as strong as it can be. So I would just uh, implore the board to really solicit and understand and act on the feedback that we get and really promote engagement because I think it's an area where we have been lacking. Any other comments before we vote? All right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, the motion carries. <clears throat> Thank you, Mrs. Johnson. Next on our agenda, item J is personnel matters, and for that I invite uh, Dr. Mayo to come forward. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairwoman Johnson, Dr. Dance, members of the board. I'd like cons board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves of absence, and certificated appointments. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters presented as exhibits J1 through 4? Move. Second. All right, there's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Mrs. Johnson. I just wanted to um, take some time to recognize Karen Harris, who's the principal at Fort Garrison Elementary. And she's been there for 34.9 years. My children have <coughs> had the pleasure of having her just for a year because they just transferred. But um, she was, she's inclusive, invite, uh, inviting, and innovative. She's one of the Lighthouse School principals, and she said that she stayed on for the last three years because of Dr. Dance's vision, because of the, the system as a whole's vision. Um, so I want to thank her for that. I want to thank her for teaching her, her staff and her parents and her students that you know, building relationships is the cornerstone of, of being a quality administrator. And those were her words that you know, she has learned how to build relationships, and hopefully that will, will carry on beyond her, her tenure there. So thank you. <coughs> All right, the motion is to uh, approve um, exhibits J1 through 4. All in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? There's none. The motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Next on our agenda is administrative appointments, and I call on Dr. Dance. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Manager of Network Support Services in the Office of Network Support and Senior Business Analyst in the Office of Enterprise Applications. Do I have a motion to approve administrative appointments K-1, uh, presented in K-1? That move. The Se second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Very good. The ayes have it. Dr. Dance. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. We do have one individual who's being promoted tonight who's here with us. Uh, currently, right now, an IT business process analyst in the Office of Enterprise Applications, not going too far, uh, becoming the senior business analyst in that same office. That's Ms. Kara Hobbs. <laughs> Kara, congratulations on your promotion. Do you have any family or friends here with you this evening celebrating with you? <laughs> As he's waving, and he's very happy. So congratulations to you on your promotion. Uh, we look okay. forward, Mr. Chair, to introducing James Holden, who's our new manager for network support. But he currently works right now in that office as well. So congratulations again, Kara. Thank you, Dr. Dance, and congratulations. Uh, next item is contracts. And for that, I call on our contracts committee chairman, Mr. McDaniels. Um, we, uh, let's go. Oh, we're going <laughs> to. We're going to do this. We're going to do them group. one at a time. Yes, but you, yes. you, okay. you're welcome to. All right. Um, I'll call forth Mrs. Saris and Mr. Dixit then. <clears throat> so the first item uh, that we have this evening uh, is contract MWE 812-17, evaluation of our second uh, language acquisition program. Okay, are there there are questions, Mr. McDaniel. Do you want me just to lead? Is it fine? Very good, yes, Mrs. Mrs. Causey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that we postpone this contract for a vote until after July one. 
Um, I think it would be a good idea since there's a number of questions and concerns about this contract that uh, we delay it until we have our uh, new interim superintendent. Is there a motion to postpone <coughs> consideration of this contract, which is L1? Second. There's a motion and a second uh, discussion. Mrs. Causey. Mr. Chair, just to speak to my motion, uh, unlike many of the other contracts that we'll be voting on tonight, uh, this does not impact any of our academic programs. It does not impact our facilities. Um, what it is is it's a very complicated and long-term uh, evaluation that has a lot of questions about it in that we've already approved a contract and finished an evaluation for $100,000 over two years. Um, also, there's many other things that need to be evaluated, and I'm not sure that this is the priority since we do already have a completed evaluation of our program. So I don't believe it's urgent or necessary that we vote on it tonight, but I do think it uh, needs <coughs> consideration, so that's why I would suggest that we postpone it. Any other discussion? Mrs. Miller. Thank you. There has been a number of questions raised by stakeholders regarding um, this vendor, and, and I have a number of questions as well regarding the program and the evaluation of that program. So I also think it would be wise to, uh, to delay until we have a new superintendent in place. Very good. Any other comments? All in favor of the motion to uh, postpone consideration of uh, L1, uh, please raise your hands. The motion fails. Um, any other questions about uh, L1? Mrs. Causey, your hands raised. I would suggest then that we vote no on this contract. We've spent $100,000 already on evaluating the program for two years, which would be $50,000 a year. Now suddenly we're having another evaluation through a different organization for $750,000 over four years and four months. Uh, this is um, being procured under a Chicago Board of Education contract. Uh, they've had uh, numerous turmoil and um, uh, honestly scandal there uh, in recent years with contracts, um, including Barbara Boyd Bennett, who was convicted of felony related to a contract. Um, additionally, there are other things that need to be evaluated, and I would just ask um, Dr. Dance, for instance, it was uh, promised that there would be an evaluation of the high school schedule change that was done after three years, and I've not seen a contract or I've not seen it on the curriculum committee agenda where uh, seven of our <coughs> high schools highest performing ones lost their seven period day schedule, uh, including Delaney and Locker Haven High School and many others. Uh, and also there were four schools that lost their semester schedule, including Hereford High School, Patapsco, Catonsville, and Eastern Tech, if I recall. So I would not vote for this. There are other things that need to be money spent on. This money could go for social workers that the board wanted to have and uh, they were not improved in the budget. Additional counselors that re were requested and additional audit staff that was requested by Mr. Virch. So there's a number of other critical priorities that should be considered before we commit ourselves to a four-year, four-month uh, <coughs> contract. Any other comments about um, L1? Mrs. Miller. Yes, I have some questions. Uh, why are we changing contractors? Uh, the contractor has been selected to continue the evaluation um, at the middle school level um, as well as include student performance uh, measurements and uh, we determined that uh, this vendor was better able to provide those services. Wait, were there any issues with our old vendor? Uh, no. Um, because I, I looked at the, um, the new vendor, American Institute for Research, and it seems to concentrate on behavioral and social science research, not language acquisition. Well, there is a staff member, uh, highly recognized 
nationally for uh, their work in uh, language studies. Dr. Brown, do you want to address this? Yeah, specific. <laughs> you can sit down at the microphone over. <laughs> in this case is Dr. Diane August, who is actually a former member of the Center of Applied Linguistics. She was a senior researcher at the Center of Applied Linguistics. Prior to moving to the American Institutes of Research, she has over 40 years of experience in second language acquisition, um, both um, second language acquisition in terms of uh, students who are learning English, as well as world languages. Um, she is the premier expert in this area nationally. Okay, and that, that's just one staff member though, not the, not the organization itself. The organization itself is quite large and provides research in a number of areas. Um, they have a division or a organizational component that is dedicated to second language acquisition. Thank you. And why are we piggy piggybacking off the Chicago Public Schools contract? Uh, because our knowledge of this vendor uh, indicated that uh, it was uh, provided advantages to us uh, and it is permitted under, permitted and encouraged, in fact, under Maryland procurement laws. Um, Ms. Causey had mentioned how the original contract uh, for the evaluation ran for <coughs> two years, or was it two and a half? I thought it was. I believe it was two years. Two years for 100,000, and now we have a new contract with a new vendor for another four and a half years. Um, this is even more costly than the evaluation of STAT. How long do we go about evaluating a program before we decide whether or not it's beneficial? Um, I think until the, uh, I think the program is beneficial and that's what the previous report indicated. Um, and uh, we're simply continuing. Uh, we have acquired additional funding for the passport program in the FY18 budget that was presented uh, by the superintendent, the board, and now the county executive and we want to maintain our uh, <coughs> management of that program. But I don't see, I don't, I don't see that that explains why we're continuing to evaluate or what is the purpose of this evaluation? Is it to determine effectiveness? What, what is yes, the purpose? Effectiveness and student achievement. Okay, so it'll be a total of six and a half years by the end of this contract that we've been evaluating and about a million dollars spent. I mean, that's a lot of money. Well, but the program is only partially, very partially implemented, um, well less than half of the BCPS school. So if we are going to actually see the expansion through system-wide, it's uh, necessary to measure that progress. And so will there be results that we can say, okay, this is working, this is not, or we should halt expansion? Is yes. that the point of uh -huh. it? Exactly. Okay, because that's not what we have been seeing, like with STAT or other programs. Where We've already got a report from Cal on the passport program, so this, that's more relevant to this particular contract than technology. Mrs. Johnson. So the time frame of the contract doesn't bother me at all. Four and a half years, I mean, we evaluate everything from STAT to Lighthouse to our kindergartners for the next 12 years. So we evaluate a lot of things. I just want to know the difference in what this contract is offering versus the other contract so I can um, be confident in, in the additional funds that we're going to be spending on it. And I <coughs> just to backtrack, with STAT, we do get an evaluation. With this, we do get an evaluation. And as Then, then we don't. So we are getting evaluations for everything, including this. Correct. As we have been. Correct. Thank you. And so student awesome. achievement is the, the most significant addition to this contract. 
And so <coughs> what are we measuring in student achievement? Because I know that's, it's, they're, they're seeing the, they're going into the Middlebury program on a kind of limited basis right now. So how are we measuring student achievement? Just pr finishing the program or proficiency? No. Um, one of the things that we really want to be responsive to the board in, in regard to this, um, this will be a mixed method of evaluation. So you will have classroom observations. You'll have many of the things that you've had before. Um, part of the inflation of the cost has to do with the expansion of the program over time. Um, and as Mr. Saris has said, then uh, another <coughs> segment of that cost then is measuring student achievement. And that is measuring student achievement against standard. That is, what is the expectation in terms of language acquisition at point in time? Um, and that, frankly, is a rather expensive process because the one thing, and I think I've heard you reflect this, uh, Ms. Johnson, was uh, in listening to students speak, you weren't hearing what you anticipated. Uh, measuring listening and speaking in students is uh, a time and labor expensive process. And expansion, we started with how many schools, and by the end of this four and a half years, where do we, where do we plan on going? But I think that will depend on the scale up over time. And you know, one of the, the things that we do with a, an evaluation like this is a formative evaluation. You provide feedback to the board over time, which then informs what works into the budget in terms of scaling over time. But we started with how many schools? I do not have that. I believe we started <laughs> with 10, it went to 25, and next year we'll be at 40. Or maybe this year we're at 40. Yeah. Yeah, that inflation sounds, sounds about right with the dollar amount. Thank you. Mrs. Causey. Um, I just wanted to ask Dr. Dance, where is the evaluation? Where does it stand for the high school schedule change that impacted all 24 schools? We're, the, question, the question that's on the table now is, M is uh, L1, and that has to do with the evaluation of the second language acquisition program. I understand that, so, and Ms. So Johnson we'll, just brought in to no, the so fact gonna, that we evaluate stat and we evaluate other things. We're going to stay on the topic. So this is a part of that discussion. No, no, it's not. In terms of making choices of where our resources the, go. Mrs. Causey, that's not part of the discussion. So the issue is L1, evaluation in the second language acquisition program. Any more discussion on that? Mrs. Eaton. Yeah. What happens to the program if we choose uh, not to pass this tonight? Uh, well, as I said, the program is funded and will continue. Uh, <coughs> With or without this evaluation? Yeah. But I think it's important to Ms. evaluate okay. new Mrs. Miller, program. you have the last, the last question on this Thank issue. you. Um, the 2015 evaluation was supposed to look at language proficiency, correct? The 2015 yeah. report? The evaluation that came out of the original contract. Okay. That was supposed to look at language proficiency, I understand. Um, I don't have that in front of me. Okay. Um, I but have it. I understand that the, um, that language proficiency data was not provided by BCPS, so they couldn't actually perform an evaluation of that. So it, it, uh, if that's the case, it appears to me that we didn't meet our objectives for the original contract, and now we're doing a much bigger contract for an extended period of time and a lot more money um, doesn't seem to be a wise use of funding. Okay. Um, Mrs. Causey, I guess you'll have the last word on this one. Thank you. I do have in front of me the contract that was approved in January 20th of 2015 that was in fact for two years and six months, as Ms. Miller pointed out, for $100,000. And in it, it was supposed to evaluate and provide a report on program effectiveness, student engagement, and language proficiency. I would also point out that we have a very capable Office of Research and Accountability that can do these types of uh, uh, performance uh, <coughs> metric evaluations, and we also have a very um, robust community um, development, community involvement, and a marketing department, communications department that can do these other sorts of focus groups uh, and analysis that would be necessary. Okay, the question before us is whether to approve contract L1. All in favor, please raise your hand. The motion carries. The next item is contract L2, um, Program Improvement Process for Equity. Uh, this is a cooperative contract <coughs> based on Dallas Independent School District uh, for professional <coughs> development of BCPS staff to increase uh, their ability to identify 
uh, a diversified group of students and uh, enroll them in CTE programs. Are there any questions of Mr. Saris regarding uh, L2? Mrs. Crosby. <clears throat> Mr. Saris, I was just wondering um, two things. One, it says the contract will provide professional development for up to 25 administrators, teachers, or counselors who work with the career and technology education. Um, how are those uh, folks selected, or are they already selected? I uh, have to ask uh, Dr. Boswell McComas to answer that. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so the process would work as this. Part of this uh, contract, um, our central, our CTE office um, would be working with this organization to develop our uh, data dashboard in which we would be able to analyze entire uh, CTE enrollment by uh, subgroup across the entire district. That's step one. From that process, we then drill down to identify the specific schools that would use this support um, first and foremost. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then my second question is, uh, it says that the vendor has reviewed the data privacy agreement. Does that mean that they've signed it and will abide by it? Yes. Okay, great. Thank Any you. Any other questions? Mr. Stewart. That ability to aggregate and disaggregate data, does that exist now or are we counting on this vendor to actually <coughs> provide that capability? We do not have that, that capacity at this point. That's part of the benefit of this contract is it would help us develop that um, capacity. And that capacity will exist even if this, when and if this vendor contract ends. Yes, It'll that's correct. Right. Mrs. Miller. Um, in the um, summary, it refers to equitably counsel students. What does it mean to equitably counsel students? What we're really getting at here, and this is in complete alignment with our board policy around equity. So what we see often in CTE careers is we see underrepresentation. Uh, one of the primary examples is that we uh, see nationally and we see within our own programs underrepresentation of females in uh, STEM related careers, engineering, computer programming. Um, and so this is w one example of the type of um, counseling um, and encouragement that we're sending, the messages that we're sending students around careers and career opportunities. Okay, so it, it's, it's to encourage enrollment in underrepresented groups. Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. All right, the question is uh, to approve contract L1, all in, I'm sorry, L2. All in favor, please raise your hand. Contract's approved. The next contract is L3, Wide Area Network Upgrade. Okay, um, this uh, contract uh, is a competitive proposal uh, for which we received one bid. Uh, it will provide increased bandwidth for our existing wide area network, uh, which is currently served uh, by both Comcast and Baltimore County government. Um, and uh, we will uh, expand the number of, uh, expand the bandwidth at a number of sites um, identified here and uh, add a more competitive price so that uh, overall uh, we seek to lower costs um, and uh, increase uh, E-rate revenues. Are there questions of Mr. Saris about uh, this contract? Mrs. Causey. Mr. Sarris, I was wondering which facilities will be uh, provided upgrades? Uh, I don't have a list, uh, but I believe that it, uh, and unless Mr. Uh, Brown is here. Yeah. Mr. Brown is here. <coughs> the, the list varies, but I'll just give you a few. Uh, Relay Elementary School, Northeast Elementary School B, and sit their new new construction. Then we got Victor Villa, Perry Hall Middle School, Overly High School, Pikesville High School, Mays Chapel, and so on. So if I can provide the full list if you guys, at the board's discretion. Would he be able to do that? Yes, please. Okay. Thank That'd you. be great. And then if you want, want to stay, the second question is probably for you as well. Um, if you could just spend a little more, uh, a little <coughs> moment explaining about um, how Baltimore County Public Schools is going to save money by doing this um, because of the E-rate and how that works out. 
The E-rate program gives us guidelines as a school district uh, to provide bandwidth to our schools. And as we contract with our vendors, then we get uh, a rate back, which is uh, based on our uh, farms. Uh, rate, which right now I think is at four, or is at 48%. So with when we sign the contract with the vendor, they give us that uh, monthly fee, and then we'll get 48% of that back from that vendor. <coughs> and okay. we do have to file for that every year. Okay, thank you. And how much money do you think that represents on this contract? I think approximately $500,000 in savings. Okay, thank you very much. We appreciate the work of the team on that. Other questions? All right, all in favor of approving contract L3, please raise your hands. <coughs> Very good, it's approved. The next contract is L4, parking lot improvements at the Halstead Academy. Good evening. Mr. Dixon. Next two contracts are good news story. These are for uh, parking lot improvements and site work. Uh, I'll take one contract at a time. L4 is LKO40417, is for parking lot and sidewalk, sidewalk improvements Let's at Let's go the other one High first. School. Let's go the other one first. L4 is the Halstead Academy. Okay, on, on my list it was, well, okay. I'll go take that. L4 is the parking lot improvements at Halstead Academy, and the contract will provide all labor material required for the construction of parking lots, bus loop, service area, a reconstruction of two existing entrances and renovations to metal canopy and all the associated work. Are there questions of Mr. Dixit regarding uh, the parking lot improvements at Halstead? Seeing none, all in favor of approving contract L4, please raise your hands. That contract is approved. L5 is parking lot and sidewalk improvements at Overly High School. This is a similar contract to the one you just approved. And this contract will also provide labor and material for the construction of two parking lots there, a bus loop, service area, reconstruction of two entrances, and renovations to metal canopy, and all of the associated work. Are there any questions of Mr. Dixit regarding L5 and improvements at Overly High School? All in favor of approving contract L5, please raise your hands. That contract is also approved. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Saris. Next on our agenda is item M and its new business, proposed boundary for Victory Villa Elementary School. And for that, I invite uh, quite a team up, Dr. Brown, Dr. Martin Knox, Mr. Roberts, and uh, Mr. Cropper. Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairwoman Johnson, Ms. White, and members of the board. This evening, I'm joined by two of my colleagues. To my right, Mr. George Roberts. Um, to my left, Mr. Matthew Cropper. And also joining us is Dr. Russ Brown. This evening, we would like to present to you the Victory Villa Committee boundary recommendations for the um, opening of Victory Villa in 2018. As a part of the capital plan, Schools for our future. It is Baltimore County Public Schools is currently engaged in two construction projects in the northeast area of Baltimore County. These projects are designed to improve the facilities and increase student capacity to help relieve overcrowding in this area. The replacement of Victory Villa Elementary School on the existing site will add 409 seats, while the new Northeast Elementary School will add approximately 700 seats. In order to make the best and most efficient use of student capacity, this added student capacity, in accordance with Baltimore County Public Schools Board of Education Policy and Rule 1280, the superintendent approved the initiation of this boundary process in May of 2016. Through the boundary study, Baltimore County Public Schools supports a process that fully engages the community and shares information about the process openly and with all stakeholders. 
The boundary process for Victory Villa Elementary School began in January of 2017 and will be presented to the board in June of 2017 for a final approval. The boundary process for the new Northeast Elementary School will begin in September of 2017 and will be presented to the board for approval in March of 2018. The boundary study committee for Victory Villa Elementary School um, the boundary change process, we met seven times from January until April. Over the past few months, we've reviewed um, several boundary change options and reviewed those formulated plans in conjunction with the community as well as with Baltimore County Public Schools. So here with us this evening to present the processes and the committee recommendation is Matthew Cropper from Cropper GIS. Thank you, Dr. Martin Knox. Mr. Chair, members of the board, thank you again for the opportunity to be here tonight. As Dr. Martin Knox said, my, um, my role here tonight is to provide a comprehensive overview of the Victory Villa boundary study process, along with the recommendations um, that are being presented to you on behalf of the committee. <laughs> Toggle this. Uh, we're, having, we're having technical difficulty over here. Yeah. There it goes, okay. Thank you. So the process uh, occurred in four phases. The planning process was between August and December 2016. <clears throat> and during this time, the superintendent initiated a boundary, the, the actual process. Um, principals were oriented uh, on the process and, and also the community was reached out to and communicated about what's coming up. Um, the staff and the consultant prepared data and information in preparation for work with the committee and then the committee was convened. The actual process of working with the committee occurred between January and April of 2017. And that leads us to uh, where we are today with a uh, uh, presentation to the school board following by a pre uh, uh, anticipated board decision in June 2017. Um, possibly earlier, I think it's earlier than that. The new boundary would be implemented in the 2018-19 school year. Um, the, the, the schools that, um, that could potentially be impacted by this, this process are listed on the screen here. Um, we have identified these schools as those who could be impacted, and we told them that any student in this area or any student that attends or lives within these school areas could be impacted as a result of this process. The following factors are driving the need to look at attendance boundaries in this area. So this is the reason why we had to uh, convene this committee. Um, reconstruction and expansion of Victory Villa Elementary School, which opens in 2018-19 with a capacity increase from 326 to a target of 735. So the capacity at this school was nearly doubling. Um, Victory Villa Elementary and six of the seven schools in the study area are overcrowded. Four, including Victory Villa, exceed 115% of capacity, and Shady Springs Elementary School is severely overcrowded at over 130% of capacity. <coughs> the objectives that were provided to the committee, uh, this community-based uh, committee, um, were the following. To reduce overcrowding in the region, to create viable, successful boundaries to effectively utilize the added capacity at Victory Villa Elementary, and to support diversity among schools that reflect the community <coughs> and the school system. As they were considering boundary adjustments, we always guided them to um, policy and rule 1280 to, as rules to follow. In addition to that, other considerations were the use of geographic features such as railroads, creeks, and major highways, and elimination of existing satellite boundaries. So those are areas that are <coughs> a school may have uh, a primary boundary, but then another smaller boundary that's not contiguous to the main boundary. And that existed in this area, and that was one of the focus to try to get those students closer to their home. <coughs> in terms of the boundary study committee, the committee was made up of 34 members. There were eight principals who uh, participated in the process, but they were non-voting members. 24 teachers and parents, and principals worked with the community to identify one teacher and two parents from each of these schools that could be affected. In addition to that, there were two area educational advisory council chairs. 
The committee was supported by the community superintendent, facilitated by, by, by my firm, Cropper GIS Consulting, and assisted by the administrative staff. Um, we also had a specialist who's, uh, who's um, a specialist in collaborative engagement working with us through this process, uh, Ms. Melanie Bell, and she was very helpful in the process as well. <coughs> The committee met seven times from January 2017 to April 2017. Um, they reviewed and agreed upon the neighborhood planning blocks to support the study. So these were the small building blocks that were used to identify and develop different boundary scenarios. Um, they discussed and revised multiple scenarios through the course of the study. Um, the, there were many factors and avenues, avenues provided to the committee to communicate and, and to make sure that things were as transparent as possible. The website um, is, was a repository for all of the information that was presented to the committee throughout the entire process. Um, there was an email address that was uh, where we welcomed comments from the public throughout the entire process. Um, interactive maps so the public could look at maps and look at options and turn things off and on and see how things they would be affected. Um, and these were all uh, sources and resources that the committee used to help uh, continue their work. In terms of uh, reaching beyond the committee, the public was, was, uh, was very active in this process. Um, letters were sent to all families in October 2016 regarding the process and uh, followed up by notice in school letters and other outreach. So the goal is to really um, notify and educate people that this process was occurring. Uh, the public were invited to attend, to attend all committee meetings as observers, and we had a good number of uh, public members in attendance at, at every single meeting, um, especially as, as the meetings, uh, the process started to mature. All meetings were streamed live, streamed live on BCPS web, the website, and uh, that, those are still active there, and you can still go back and see any of the, uh, the, the, the meetings um, that were recorded. And again, all of the, the, everything that was provided to the committee was provided on this website, so the public is, um, was, was welcome to go review the materials, and, and actually they, had, this, they could, had the opportunity to have all the same materials that the committee was looking at as the process continued. The public were invited to provide input throughout the process through the uh, email and the BCPS website. So I, I had mentioned that. We also had a public information meeting that uh, had approximately 250 people in attendance. Um, in, in when we had that public information meeting, we presented the maps and the, and the overview of the process and we invited them to participate in an online survey. The results of that survey yielded 274 unique respondents, um, which provided us information that we could study to try to bring us closer to our objectives and, um, and uh, while adhering to the rule and policy 1280. The committee considered 14 scenarios as a whole over, uh, throughout the entire process. They looked through um, all of the materials and um, I really commend this committee on their work. Um, there's a lot of statistics and maps and, um, and we always encourage them to look at the information but at every single meeting uh, we gave them time to look at things before they had to make other decisions and they really looked at every, I saw them looking at every single piece of information and data throughout the process and I was really proud of the work, hard work that they put into this um, process. It's, redistricting is never easy and, um, and they did recognize that no single scenario will satisfy the considerations equally and I know that um, they they bring forward a recommendation, but um, there's always pros and cons, and uh, you know, no plan is going to be perfect, but um, the recommendation they bring forward is one that, that I feel is sound. Um, they selected options to present to the public information and via survey, and um, they thoughtfully considered input from the public information session after that session was completed, and we scheduled an additional meeting in April to make sure that they had adequate time to work through all of the data and information to, to, to provide a sound recommendation. Um, at the public information, we had four maps that came forward to, to them, A through, A through D, and then two additional maps were created as a result of uh, input from the public, E and F. Um, in addition, there were some variants of maps as well. But you can see here the, the four maps that were presented at the public. These are the final, the <coughs> final four that, were, uh, that, were, that they were working through. Option A, B, C, 
uh, D1, which is a variant that, that was made at the, the final meeting, E1, and then F. So there are more. There were more than four options at the at the final time, and you could see the boundaries did uh, do vary from 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 uh, from option to option, and um, as the committee was looking for uh, the the best recommendation. There were some other iterations and, and adjustments made. As I mentioned, D1 was a variant off of D, and it was d made actually. Uh, there was a, a public comment that was provided that talked about a road that on the on the map it looked like it was one straight solid road, but the road was actually cu uh, cut off and was not connected. And the public member uh, brought it to our attention and that this that if this area were to stay in one bl planning block, it would have some transportation inefficiencies. And that was something that we that we had, uh, listened to and made adjustments to help align and maximize transportation efficiency. In addition, there were comments from the committee um, to, to make some other adjustments for, um, <coughs> for the maps, um, which moved 34 students back into Shady Spring for option E um, from Orem's. And that was something that was, um, that was made, which created option E1 uh, variant. So as the committee, when the, the, in, the final, in the final meeting, they really, again, looked through everything. Um, the, the voting members present the recommended option D1 as their recommendation. The tally at the final meeting was uh, there were 10 votes in favor of option D1 and six votes in favor of option E1. So D1 is the, is the recommendation. A little bit about that recommendation. Um, the enrollment is balanced for all the schools Except Orem's Elementary, you'll see that Orem's Elementary is 85 students over capacity. Um, and the reason why uh, we, we, have, we had looked at that and studied that throughout this process, and there was a large number of special mission trans per permission transfers at Orem's Elementary, a large number of students that attend the school from out of boundary. And uh, the district has, has recognized that and is going to make, uh, make improvements to that to, to ensure that the school doesn't get overcrowded for, due to students attending from out of boundary. And so that's something that will be, um, that will be uh, bringing the numbers down eventually at Orem's Elementary. So, um, so as I mentioned, 29% of the enrollment, 90 students attending Orem's or special permissions transfers are cu currently coming from out of boundary. And that's something that can be controlled to bring those numbers down closer to capacity. Can we interject or yeah. wait till he goes through it all? Um, <coughs> I guess the answer is yes. Is it? Is it? Are you sure. able to fly with questions? Yes, sir. And if, and right. if there's a it's question that 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 can be answered later, I you know I would. And Mr. Virch had his hand up and wanted to ask a question. Uh, thank you very much, um, um, Mr. Gillis. I really want to commend all the committee folks who invested so much time in attending a lot of these meetings. Uh, but for that. Um, interview panel I was on for uh, um, that ethics uh, review panel that we have. We had a vacancy and had to go there. I was at every one of the study meetings. A um, lot of interest on in folks and to the, to the uh, processes credit and the folks who participated in it, uh, it was about as transparent as can be. Uh, anything anyone said, there was a, a live stream going on. It's uh, on videotape. You can go to the website and look at it yourself. Uh, any comments that were sent in to the email, they're all there. Um, it is about as, it was about as open as anyone could suggest. I would like to ask you about an earlier comment that you made. You made reference specifically to geography, geographic features. Um, and in that, you include those man-made things like railroad embankments and railroad tracks. Um, I know something about those tracks. Uh, and when the trains weren't as competitive when I was younger, uh, I could easily run across those tracks. Now you can't do it, there's a fence up. Um, but it's a pretty hard geographic feature for purposes of our boundary processes. And there's a particular uh, planning block. And that's planning block 24. And that's a, that's a part of the Arrow Acres community, a community that has a long history in our county, um, and that would be divided in half under the 
recommended proposal. Isn't that correct? Yes, sir. That planning block is, is currently in ORMS and is not in ORMS in the, um, the recommendation. You are correct. Great. And that, that planning block, um, is it fair to say there's about 65 of our students at ORMS now who live inside that planning block? I believe it's 60, but uh, yes, sir, that's um, plus and, or minus. Good and with regard to the special mission transfers at our Orms Elementary School, you indicated 20%. When you take a look, and I will say to the credit of the process, all the numbers were completely available to anyone to see. Nothing was kept, you know, from anybody. Uh, they were even giving away maps, and that's how I got a couple of the ones that I have in front of me. Uh, the current level of special permission transfers in other schools that are in the boundary study, other than ORMS, uh, that's about a single digit percent of special permission transfers. Um, my recollection is it's uh, maybe seven or eight or nine percent or so for the other schools. Um, this, our own ORMS, though, is a little bit higher. It was, it was closer to like uh, 30 percent. Isn't that correct? Yes, sir. That's so correct. when you said 20, you. Yeah, it's just 20 points difference. 29%. Really, yeah, yes, yeah sir. exactly. So I, and, and I can understand that. Um, I wanted to just ask you that there was also a sat what was referred to as a satellite area. And if you could take just a moment and, and share with the folks tonight, because all the folks who were in that study process and who came in as observers, they know about the satellite, but there's a lot of folks who may be watching and our board members who may not yet have, have had the opportunity to go through a boundary study process. And we're, as you've heard announced, we're gonna have another one for Perry Hall. If you could just explain what is meant by a satellite area. Yes, sir. A satellite in, in this instance was, uh, it currently exists for Middlesex Elementary School. So there's a boundary that surrounds Middlesex Elementary. But in addition to that area that feeds Middlesex based on their uh, residential um, address. There is another area that's up near Glenmar. It's east of Glenmar Elementary. That is, um, um, there are a couple of school boundaries in between that, that area. So it's a non-contiguous area that is um, where those students, anybody who lives inside that area, whose home address is in that area, <coughs> attends Middlesex Elementary. So they are, it's a, it's a, discon a non-contiguous zone. So there are actually two boundaries that make up the Middlesex Elementary uh, elementary attendance area right now. Uh, the, and the term of art, non-contiguous, means it's out here, it's not over here, where the Middlesex contiguous that school boundary is. Is that correct? That's correct, yes, sir. And the children that are in that satellite area right now, they ride a bus from this non-contiguous area out beyond Glenmore Elementary School, and they ride that bus, really, they ride four buses every day from that area over to our Middlesex Elementary School. Is that right? Yes, sir, <clears throat> that's correct. And with the opening of a new 700-seat Victory Villa Elementary School, a school, as many of you know, I attended for the third grade and rode a bus from Hawthorne over, from Hawthorne over to Victory Villa, um, part of this process was to absorb these students who every day, these four busloads of students who've been riding these buses all the way over to Middlesex. And they would be absorbed in schools closer to where they reside. Isn't that also correct? Yes, that is the objective. Yes, sir. Is to, is the, the satellite area is one piece of the, of the puzzle or the considerations to consider. So you have to look at everything and all the different factors when you're creating a plan. But that is certainly one to try to assign students close to home if possible. But, um, you know, but you also have to balance all of the different factors in, cr in creating a plan. And by absorbing them, that's one of the benefits of uh, the plan that the committee recommended. Isn't that correct? Yes, sir. But that committee, now that committee, uh, it totaled a do it totaled double digits, didn't it? Like 26, or was it? I heard you say 34. Could you explain the difference in those numbers? Uh, yes, there were 34 total members, but um, there, some of those 34, there were non-voting members. They were like the principals. Principals, of the yes, sir. And so um, there were 24 or 26 <clears throat> voting members. 
um, 24 teachers and parents, and then two educational area advisory council chairs. Those were the voting members, yes, sir. And when our and when our very hardworking uh, voting members would go and vote during our study sessions, they would take dots that only they could have because they were a voting member, and they'd put them on different options. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And in that and in doing that process, one could see very vividly the dots. Like for example, on this uh, what I have here, this uh, this is a sample of option E, and this is just for demonstrative purposes. There's a red dot up here. And then all the voting members could go and place their dot on whichever map they wanted to. And sir. I hear you say yes. And if all 26 of them were there, well then whatever maps were there, there'd be 26 dots out wherever they would be. And then one could add up these dots and see, well, here's what most of the committee liked and here's what they didn't. Is that right? Yes, sir. That's now, on the final study, boundary study meeting, when the votes were taken, I heard you say that the vote was 10 to 6. And that 10 to 6, that means there were 16 voting members who participated in the decision making about a boundary process involving all of these schools. Isn't that right? Yes, sir. And notwithstanding the fact that there were 26 members, the fact is the decisions made by 10 of 26 folks determined what was going to be the recommended option for this board. Is that right? Um, there were 16 total voting members present. Yes, sir. Right, but it was 10 who selected an option. Yes, sir, that's correct. And that was the majority at that time. That's correct. Yes, which sir. also then means that there was another 10 folks who weren't there. Yes, sir. And it's also very difficult to get folks over four months to sustain their participation in any worthwhile community activity. Yes, sir. I mean, they are volunteers, and, um, and, and we, we appreciate their commitment. Um, and we encourage them to participate at every single meeting. Yes, sir. So the, the recommended uh, option that's come before our board is not a reflection of 26 members. It is a reflection of far fewer, only 10. 16 out of the 26, yes, sir. The recommended option, though, having received only 10 votes. Yeah, you, got, you got that point across already. Thank you very much. <clears throat> all right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Very good. Mrs. Eaton. Hi. Maybe I missed the point, but if you have school A and school B, why are you taking students out of school A and putting them in B just to take kids out of B and put them in A? Okay. Well, that's a, that's, that's a good question, and, uh, and there's something that we call the, the domino effect. So there are, there are many schools in this area that need relief. Um, one would think that, okay, well, we're expanding Victory Villa, so let's just add all of the students that, that are overcrowded um, into Victory Villa to, and then and, and impact the fewest number of students. But really, in reality, when you start to look at modeling options and creating options, you, there, there is a cause and effect. And so in order to, say, for instance, provide relief to Shady Spring, they have to be sent to, to a certain, to some school that's close, that's as close, if not closer, to the school. And then, and then as a result of that, that building becomes overcrowded. And so then you have to move students from that building to another school. And it's really a, it's really a challenge um, to balance utilization and try to address all of the factors. Um, Middlesex Elementary, um, with they had a, there was probably, I don't know how many students, but there was a large number of students in the, in the enclave, in the satellite area. And with that going into, um, uh, into a school closer to, to home, that required to, to add students to Middlesex to bring them up to a more effective utilization. And, um, and there were um, lots of different pieces and parts and factors that the committee has to consider when they're looking at it. But, um, and so there is some give and take in, in the process and that some, in order to, to balance things out, there is some shifting that occurs like that. Um, but I can assure you that, um, that the impacts and everything is counted and monitored as, as this is occurring. And so there is definitely a concerted effort to minimize the amount of inefficiency that, that, that needs to happen in order to balance things out in the area. Okay, thank you. I don't, I don't agree with it, but um, we have some signs. F1 option, can you explain the F1 option that we don't see here? Um, well, I did hear, I have read um, some, 
some of the email dialogue since the recommendation was provided. And um, F1 is a variation off of the F option that was, um, that was at the final meeting with uh, um, presented to the committee. And there are some, uh, with some modifications to that. And so that is the, that is what is being referred to from the public or as option F1. And can this um, be considered for us to vote on? Everything can be considered. Yes. So we can put this in our well, voting. Yes, ma'am. I, I, um, I will defer to the, to the chair, uh, Mr. Chair, but, um, you know, the school board has the power to do what they wish to do. Um, uh, what I'm presenting is a recommendation on behalf of the committee as a result of this process that, uh, that they went through. So uh, there are a bunch of other hands that are coming up around here. I want to make certain, I think we've probably addressed most of your PowerPoint. Is there more presentation that you want or need to give us before we have more questions? Um, other than, you know, I, was, I presented some statistics, which I believe you have in front of you, uh, showing the before and after, and then next steps. So no, I, I, I'm really completed with my, uh, my presentation, other than uh, telling the public that there is a, still a hearing that's sure. occurring, yeah. and the public has another opportunity to provide input, and then also the board of uh, the next following meeting, which the board will vote on. Mr. McDaniels, you had your hand up. Um, I just wanted to say, as Mr. Virch started to say, that I really respect and appreciate the work of the committee who invested a lot of time and, and are making this recommendation. Um, it's a little unsettling to me, though, when I look at D1, to see that Orms is, is still at 127 percent. And you mentioned that um, addressing the special permission transfers would ameliorate somewhat that overcrowding. And I wanted to ask staff, on a practical basis, how long a period does that, that something like that take? Is it something that's going to immediately affect the overcrowding, or is it going to take three or four years? As we look at special permissions, um, uh, you know, again, it's just it's a little unsettling to kind of stop and see this 127 percent number and not know uh, how long this proposed remedy might take. <coughs> So as, as students matriculate out of the school, the numbers will decrease. So instead of just telling children because of the boundary change you can no longer attend Orums who are there on special permission, uh, those students remain on special permission, but as they matriculate out of the school, the numbers will decrease. Um, and then under 5140, policy and rule 5140, special permissions are usually denied as a result of the overcrowding. Okay. So they will not be any new entrance as a result of. So again, as students matriculate out, the numbers will diminish, but also because the school is identified as overcrowded, special permissions will not be accepted. So if I understand you correctly, a second grader in there on a special permission transfer is going to be there Three for years. a while. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, Mrs. Johnson, then Mrs. Causey, and then back to Mr. Virch. Thank you. What schools were affected um, the most, more most impacted by the D <coughs> option? <laughs> um, well, I think that in almost, um, there were 184 students in that satellite area for Middlesex. Okay. And in every scenario, those students are assigned to Victory Villa Elementary School. And so that would be the largest, the largest cohorts of students that um, that have uh, that were imp that were moved. Um, so Middlesex and Victory Villa. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And there, you know, there are <coughs> there were some other adjustments, but I would I would say that Middlesex was probably the the most Im impacted as a result of this <coughs> of this process to tr and with the focus on trying to get students from that satellite closer to a home school. Okay, and then in, in this, have you have you had a chance to look at option F1? I have, yes, okay. ma'am. What stu what schools were most affected in F1? F1 um, is again, I think it's the middle sex as well, but um, the 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 variation off of F F that makes F1 is to uh, move an area from that was in Orem's in option F back to Shady Spring. 
and that would um, that would then those students already go to Shady Spring. But the result of that would put Shady Spring even at a higher utilization. I, I and um, I. So, and, and, uh, and it would put them at a little bit hi a higher utilization than what they are in the recommendation. Um, it would also impact the demographic diversity that exists in the, um, the recommended plan as well. Okay. And then the, peop the 10 people that vote, or let's say the 16 people that showed up, what schools were represented at the vote? I do not know that. Um, actually, actually, I can speak to that. Okay. All buildings were represented. Thank you. And the objection, if I, or the, the, I'm sorry, the object of the boundary study was to reduce overcrowding in the region, which obviously um, I would, when I look at the numbers that, that accomplish that in D1, create viable, successful boundaries to effectively utilize the added capacity of Victor Villa, Victory Villa and then support schools that reflect the community and school system. Have you had a chance to see if F1, um, doesn't do as much. actually reaches all of those objectives my my initial observation of the f1 proposal is um, in comparison to the recommendation is that um, is that it does bring uh, more of an imbalance in utilization for, for Shady Spring Shady Spring doesn't get the relief that they have in the recommendation <coughs> and it also provides uh, less of uh, d yeah. demographic diversity yeah. that the recommendation is providing, um, mm -hmm. and uh, particularly at Orem's, because that that um, that area moving out of Orem's and then moving the other area that was mentioned uh, previously um, of the 60 students back into Orem's would bring them closer to what their uh, demographic makeup is currently. Okay, so I'd like to see. Um, what option F1 would do for the percent minority and the free reduced lunch and, and, and see if it does actually hit all of those objectives. Yes, ma'am. Great, thank you. Mrs. Coase. That's, uh, that's okay. Thank you. Mrs. Coase. I'm just waiting for Mr. Carper to finish taking he, his notes. He's, uh, he's okay. able to do Great. it all. <laughs> he's able to do it all. Thank you very much. Um, I, I also um, thank you, Ms. Johnson, for asking that because uh, we've been receiving many emails, um, many, many emails over months, actually, about this process. So we do certainly want to um, try and address the concerns, <clears throat> and, and looking at those numbers will be helpful. Um, also, there was an issue, and I appreciate all the board members um, asking questions because you've asked some of the ones that I had, and that's great. Um, one issue that has come up is the uh, planning blocks 36, 37, and 38. And in op, can you address what is in the recommendation now versus what would be in F1? May I borrow one of your maps by chance oh. so I could reference the uh, planning block? Uh, sure. <laughs> it was pointed out in an, a stakeholder email, actually a couple, that those uh, planning blocks wanted to stay together. That that was something that was um, verbalized in the committee meetings. And I just wanted to under for all the board members to understand the okay. recommended versus F1. And the, can you can you restate the planning block? Uh, 36, 37, and 38 uh, requested by Shady Spring. Okay. So um, 36 and 37 are in Shady Spring in the recommendation. Um, and they have, in, so they are in Shady Spring in the recommended map. Um, 38 is the planning block that is moved from Shady Spring to Orem's in this um, recommendation that the committee is bringing forward. Um, <clears throat> so that, that planning block is, is the planning block that is in question, and I believe that is the planning block that is being requested to move back to um, Shady Spring um, and, and in trade move planning block 25, which is the Arrow Acres community, back into Orem's. So, um, so those, are, those are the adjustments that represent F1. 
Um, and um, actually, one of the things, if you look at um, option E1, if you have your packet, mm -hmm. option E1 um, is the option that, that in terms of just for Orem's elementary, is the option that it's the same boundary. E E1 is the op is for Orem's elementary is the same boundary as what's being proposed for F1. So you could look at E1 and you could see the demographic data for Orem's, the utilization, um, percent minority, things like that, if you wanted to look at that. So, so to follow that up, uh, so option F1 allows Shady Springs community to have back planning block 38, which they want back, and it allows Orem's to have Arrow Acres, which Arrow Acres wants to be at Orem's. I just wanted to understand that. Well, okay, I will, I will say that I have not, and I've you know, obviously been in all these meetings, I have not had a discussion with anybody at the Shady Spring in Planning Block 38 that have indicated that they want to stay in Shady Spring. Um, so um, the, the, I, I will say that in any process when you work through this, there are gonna be unhappy uh, communities and there will, and so there is going to be change that needs to occur. And there is, and um, the Arrow Acres community and Planning Block uh, 25 and such has been the most vocal community in this process. Um, but I, I do not re recall he hearing or seeing an overwhelming number of people petitioning to stay at Shady Spring. And even if they did, really the focus here has to be on a plan that's best for all students in this area and not just one school or one community or one student. And so, um, you know, I think what I would encourage the board to do, just like I encourage the committee to do, is evaluate the recommendation or any other proposals as it relates to the objectives and this, the rules and study considerations. Very good. Mrs. White. I just have uh, just one quick uh, point for the board's consideration. I think it's important for us to also think through, and again, this is just for the board's consideration, the in maintaining the integrity of the process itself. We've had a very solid um, boundary process over the years, so I just want us to take into consideration the, the volunteers, I think, that have been mentioned, the time and effort and energy of all of the committee members who have come uh, to make a recommendation to the board. So again, let's just uh, keep in mind, and again, this is for your consideration uh, for future studies what this could mean if we change the process itself what it might mean not only for future studies but also for uh, membership and participation those volunteers who are making that recommendation to the board um, for the the actual recommendation for the boundary what does that mean if their vote then doesn't count so again that's just uh, for your consideration Ms. Causey has one more question then Mr. Virch and then Mr. Stewart I'll, I'll defer to Mr. Birch and then go. <clears throat> Verlita, thank you for making that excellent, excellent point. Um, for those of you who had, when I held up this, the, the, one of these options, uh, what you can't really see are the many, many planning blocks that the citizens worked through, learned about places outside of their own school boundaries. There are just all kind of planning blocks here. <coughs> And one of the interesting things is that of all those planning blocks, and even with a 10 to 6 vote, a lot of the discussion tonight is about only a couple, only a handful depending on your viewpoint. So I think it really does go to the strength of the process. But I also note this, and, and Dr. Brown could correct me if I have it wrong, <laughs> or our consultant uh, that really just ran a great program um, could correct me if I have it wrong. But one of the options that was dismissed, or if you will, voted off the island at the earliest opportunity was that option that kind of hit every benchmark about as close as one could come 
at the beginning of the, I mean, when we finally started voting. And that one really kind of hit every single one. <laughs> and that got like, it, not the absolute least, but it got uh, very few votes. And that was my recollection when that round of voting occurred. Is that also yours? I think I think from some of the folks back there, because I know you've been through you know, a lot of these options. And I'm and I mean I guess what I would say is that um, that what we again what I mentioned earlier is that I always encourage the committee to look at what's best for every single school in the study area. And I know that what what you're hearing is is one school. But really, I, I commend the committee. They, it's not an easy task. If you get the pressure of people staring at you when you're putting stickers up there and making decisions, um, I believe that they made a, made a plan to provide a recommendation that's best overall, best balance overall for all the schools in the area. Um, so uh, as opposed to um, just uh, one school or one, one community. One hey, I'm going gonna, gonna to try to keep this yeah, yeah. on calendar, yeah. on time calendar. Mr. Stewart has a question, Mr. Yulefelder. We have a public hearing yeah. coming up on uh, May 15 where we're going to have public input and there'll be plenty of opportunity for more questions. But Mr. Virch has one more. Yeah, I said one, um, one last one. My recollection is that the plea for the reincorporation as proposed for uh, our Shady Spring Elementary School was actually made by the principal. Okay. And the, video, the videotape will speak for itself, but that's what my recollection was. And of course, it's just one principal. And the principals, and not to, not to say principals aren't important, but the principals don't vote in this process. But he did, our, he, he did articulate his reasons and he thought that it was actually not just in the interest of his school, but in the specific interest of the students in that particular planning block. And that's why I, I say again, the, the committee really did tremendous, and to use a term from the past, yeoman-like work with all of these planning blocks. And our focus at this point has now been narrowed down really to small number of planning blocks. And I would just ask that committee members keep that in mind. I'm happy to share my experience, and I will say uh, w with any of them. And I would also commend Mr. Stewart, who was kind enough to share his advice to me mm. about remembering my role as an observer, not to weigh in, not to not to articulate you should be moving this way or you should be doing it that way. And it may have been difficult at times, but it was really, really very, very good advice. And I thank m Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart. So I believe Ms. Causey did defer yeah. to Mr. Birch real quick. Mrs. Causey and then Mr. Stewart. Thank you. And I, and I do appreciate Ms. White chiming in and I, um, and <clears throat> it is very important to respect the process and the work of the volunteers and the work of the committee and the work of the staff who crunch through all these numbers and rearrange all these maps and it is a phenomenal amount of work that does get done. But I do th uh, think along the lines of Steve that the process has worked to the to the point where there are just these minor adjustments that may still need to be made to come to the best conclusion. Um, I think that one of the things that we um, can look at is what Mr. Crapper said earlier, is that this, this no plan is perfect, but he believes this is a sound plan. And I think maybe when we review the numbers that uh, Ms. Johnson asked for about what does F1 <coughs> actually represent, we may find that that is also a sound, um, a sound plan. When we look at the numbers, we'll have to look at the numbers. Um, and I did just want to also um, state that one of the things that was sent to all of the board members was the uh, Shady Springs principal stating that those planning blocks uh, have family members, uh, community members, and that he felt that his school is best equipped to teach them English, since for many it's not their first language. So we do want to keep keep in mind the academic programs that are best going to help our students uh, where they're located. And I really do appreciate all the time that you've spent. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Stewart. I'll, I'll be brief, but my question relates to ORMS and the special permission transfers. My understanding is that over the course of the next, I guess, three to five years, the percentage over capacity will decrease from this pro projected 127% number, correct? 
Yes, sir. Because of the revision <coughs> of the policy and the enforcement of the policy that we have. Yes, sir, that's correct. Do we know what happens to the percent minority as that trend continues to change? I do not have those numbers. Um, I do not. Okay. So I think that maybe is an additional thing for us to look at because under option D1, the percent minority increases from 28% to 45%, but if in five years it goes back to 30, then have we, do we have the full picture? Would be my question. So to that end, um, projecting the ethnicity of future enrollments is challenging at best. Uh, what we can do is look at the ethnicity of the students who are there by special permission transfer and make an inference about what will happen if those students uh, were removed from the building and what the building would look like, assuming that the uh, ethnic balance of the building would remain stable for the remaining population. Right, I, and I'm, all, I'm only talking within the next few years. I'm not talking about major macro trends within different communities. And Mr. Yulefelder. Uh, I just one, wanted one, to oh, sorry, one other point tied to that, though. Uh, across that region as a whole, uh, it's 65 percent. Uh, of, of the students in that are, are minority. Uh, ORMS really does stand out as being quite a lot different from, from the rest, even after this proposed boundary change. I agree. Thank you. Uh, my first boundary uh, confrontation was with West Towson. And as I remember at the time, uh, since it was in a central district and it was uh, a very active uh, community, um, the Sun paper gave it tremendous coverage. But I do remember the last paragraph of the Sun article said, in a, re in a boundary study, redistricting, not everybody's going to be happy. You do the best that you can do. Um, I believe that since that time, uh, we have strengthened 1280. We have strengthened the process dramatically. And it is a very democratic process. <clears throat> I think that we have to be careful that we don't usurp the decision of the committee. If you believe it was a fair, honest, and democratic process, um, I don't know if any of us are demographers, as they may be, but I, I think we may have to rely on uh, what the committee itself. As to the 10 people who didn't vote, uh, if you remember two years ago, maybe some of you weren't on the board, we had a situation where the boundary committee had a one vote difference. And <clears throat> after that, I, we remember talking to the chairperson, to, it, it, which has to encourage everybody on the committee to come to the final vote. I mean, that's the key to it all. And uh, it was a one vote, so, so this is not many more four, but it's unfortunate that we only had 16 out of 26 participation. It may have changed things, who knows. All right, I want to thank uh, Dr. Martin Knox <coughs> and Mr. Cropper, the rest of the team up there for your presentation. Uh, remind everybody again, Monday, May 15th at 2017 at Eastern Technical High School at 6.30, there's a public hearing. So uh, thank you all. Mr. Gillis, before we, Mar Marge Roberts, the principal of Victory Villa is here also, so we wanted to recognize her. Very good. Thank you. Appreciate it. Where is she? Good all right, next on our agenda is Perry Hall Middle School short-term relief strategies. Dr. Brown, I guess you get to stay up there. Hmm. So while they're, they're queuing that up, um, Ms. White, uh, Chair Gillis, Vice Chair, Johnson, members of the board and the community, um, here to talk about capacity relief strategies uh, in the short term for Perry Hall School, uh, middle school. Uh, as you all are aware, um, <coughs> you know, our enrollment is growing. Um, we have had an urgent need uh, to resolve elementary overcrowding in our system, and we've been addressing that over time. Um, but as those students matriculate into middle school, uh, we, we approach our, our middle school capacity as a system as a whole. And we have a couple schools in particular where we will exceed that capacity. Ridgely and Perry Hall Middle School are both schools where we will exceed that uh, capacity at those individual sites. 
And so we're very thankful um, that the uh, county executive at this point has proposed uh, a solution that would provide a new middle school uh, to provide relief and also an addition at Pine Grove, which would help us resolve some of the issues at Ridgely as well. Uh, and we believe between those two that we have a long-term solution to address middle school overcrowding both at Ridgely and Perry Hall and, and very thankful to have that. That being said, uh, we still have a short-term problem. And when we start looking at uh, relief strategies, uh, we look at relief strategies on a couple dimensions. We look at them um, in, in part in connected to uh, cost, uh, but also in terms of, of difficulty. And obviously, some of these things have already been done in the case of Perry Hall. The easiest things have already happened. So when we talk about looking at uh, analysis of the internal space of the building and how it's used, that's clearly already been, been done. The question really then is, as we work up this ladder uh, for a short-term strategy, you know, is it relocatables? Would it be annexing? Um, and what might be the best way to move forward? The county has a long history of annexing. My department, we, we went back and we took a, a peek at it. We've got uh, a history of annexing that goes uh, back into the 1960s. Uh, we've annexed whole grade levels. We've annexed parts <coughs> of grades. Uh, it, it has been a strategy that has been used over time as a means to relieve overcrowding. And those are the two short-term strategies that we're gonna look at right now. The next level up, which uh, in terms of com uh, complexity, is a, a boundary process. And typically the boundary process would be paired with the new capital programming. Uh, at this point with capital programming for Perry Hall and Ridgely coming online, um, this would be putting two boundary processes very close to one another and potentially moving students more than one time to accommodate a boundary. And it would also double the cost of the boundary process uh, for those two buildings. So we haven't talked about annexing strategies here in a while, but um, you know, we wanted to take a look at could we annex uh, some parts of the, the Perry Hall area in terms of elementary schools uh, to feed into middle schools uh, to resolve that. There are eight schools that have children that feed into Perry Hall. There's a ninth school on that list. Um, and that's Pine Grove Elementary, but it has no children. There are no residential <coughs> areas, in, uh, no residential units in that little geographic area that overlaps. Uh, within that, um, most of those schools feed directly to Perry Hall and uniformly to Perry Hall. There are, however, several schools that feed to Perry Hall, but also feed to another middle school. And so one of the questions that we had was, well, if we were to annex a grade level, incoming sixth graders, uh, as they leave these schools and have them go to the, the middle schools to which the majority of their classmates go, could we provide some relief to Perry Hall, at least in the interim, to be able to solve this challenge? So specifically, uh, if you look at Kearney, Oakley, and Vincent Farms, they all feed to multiple middle schools. And in the cases of Kearney and Oakley, they feed primarily to Pine Grove. The, the lion's share of their students fee, feed to Pine Grove. Uh, in the case of Oakley, it's not just Pine Grove, it's also Lock Raven, but again, the majority of the students feed to uh, Pine Grove. Vincent Farm, on the other hand, um, also feeds to Middle River. And, and there's a section of Vincent Farm uh, that, that feeds over to Middle River. So if we were to annex the sixth grade starting in the 2018 year, which would allow families a year to prepare for this and to think about it. And if they wanted to pursue magnet programming or other options for their children, they'd have a year to prepare to, to think about that. Because if we think about our students right now, this is late in the year. They have visited the schools that they, they're intending to matriculate to, the, their scheduling in place, staffing's been done. Families have planned already for the 17-18 <coughs> school year. That being said, if we were to uh, move the sixth graders from Oakley, Kearney, and Vincent Farms and have them go to Pine Grove and Middle River, what would the impact be? What relief would we get out of that? And we found um, that it, it does provide some relief. It, it effectively caps the enrollment um, for Perry Hall Middle School by taking out 85 kids the first year, 163 kids the next year, 
total of 249 kids the, the following year. And you can see the differences between the <coughs> utilization patterns. So it goes from 126% utilization in 2018 down to 121. It, it, it adjusts it down a little bit. The following year it goes from 129, it brings it down 10%, down to 119. The following year, it's even better yet. We go from 128 and brings it down to 113. So it does provide some temporary relief. And we thought that this could be a potentially viable solution. The other interesting thing here, uh, and would also be a challenge for um, doing a boundary process at this point, while there is uh, quite a lot of space at Pine Grove and Middle River currently, <clears throat> that space effectively evaporates during the next three years. And in fact, you only have about 250 seats available between those two sites by 2020. So while there are lots of seats now, they go away. So we don't want to move a whole bunch of kids into Pine Grove merely to, to pass the buck and have Pine Grove be overcrowded I immediately. So this solution was intended to move the students uh, within the <coughs> relatively close to the capacity of the available sites and available seats uh, in the community. So um, again, when you look at this again, Mill River would, would reach a middle, uh, maximum of about 104% utilization if we were to move these students and Pine Grove would reach a maximum of 101. So we would really effectively use the available seats in those buildings and, and you see that again, not moving necessarily a whole lot of kids out of, of Perry Hall creates a capacity utilization issue both in, in uh, Middle River and Pine Grove if you exceed it by much. You can see that um, the impact on diversity in the system in terms of farms and, and minority status is minimum. It does move uh, Perry Hall Middle School in the wrong direction by a couple percentage points. Uh, and effectively, the communities sort of balance each other out, but not perfectly. Probably the biggest challenge that we saw when we looked at this, because this was something that felt like a relatively um, precise way to utilize the capacity in our buildings and minimize movement and do it in a temporary way uh, that we could then subsequently address with the boundary when we have the ca uh, capital program and seats available. But one of the challenges that we immediately saw is that about a quarter of the students that we plan on moving have a sibling that's in Perry Hall already, which means we'd be splitting siblings up. So we'd be sending one sibling to Perry Hall and sending another sibling to Middle River. We'd be sending one sibling to Perry Hall and one sibling to, to Pine Grove. And that, um, it's just hard to support from, a, from an educational point of view. It just isn't. Uh, an ideal situation uh, in any way, shape, or form and presents a lot of challenges for families. Uh, and <coughs> what we, I think we'd find in the long run is with sibling transfers, uh, we would uh, effectively be in the same position where we'd end up having to use relocatables anyways because the siblings would request and families would request to stay at Perry Hall and it would be quite the challenge then to um, deny that and we would end up having relocatable units at the building. So despite the, the fact that we th saw some promise in this and we were pretty excited about it for a while, I in particular was pretty <laughs> excited about this as a potential uh, solution for the building. Um, you know, I think that, that in the long run, um, we have a short-term problem here. The long-term long solution is capital programming. And in the meanwhile, uh, while it's less than ideal, relocatables are probably the best of, of best case scenario in a, in a sort of a bad situation. And while nobody likes to have relocatables at their building, I, I would remind members of the board and the community um, that while we are beginning to see this problem in middle school, we've had this challenge at the elementary environment for a long time. And we have many elementary buildings that have many more relocatables than what we'd be talking about putting at this building. So again, um, we explored both annexing as well as relocatables. At this point in time, um, unfortunately, I think relocatables are the most viable solution for the next few years. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Um, we don't have a lot of time, but if, we, if anyone has a, a question now for Dr. Brown, um, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, Mrs. Causey. Thank you for that uh, presentation. I do have a, a couple questions. When you're <coughs> 
talking about the annexing, uh, potential annexing of students, um, and you said that the, that many of them have siblings, um, and do we really wish to split the siblings? I, I guess I'm wondering if you should do some sort of a mini survey to the parents, because potentially they would want to move their children, and maybe they would even want to move that older sibling. Because what we've been hearing from Perry Hall Middle School parents is that their children are waiting hours for the nurse, they are eating lunch at breakfast time or at the end of the day, they don't have a <coughs> locker. You know, so I guess my thought is if there's all of these overwhelming concerns that maybe the parents should be surveyed, what, what would they want to do? We've also seen emails asking about um, making it more widely known and or easier to allow parents to do special permission transfers. Um, so I'm wondering what has the, uh, your department or the administration thought about that or is that something that you can think about and um, get back to us before the, the, the board's going to be voting on this? When or no? No. No. This is it's just a point of information? Yep. It's an update. Okay, so has the, have you all thought about surveying the parents to see if in fact they would rather have their children at a school that has capacity for them? We could certainly look at the option of surveying those communities to see if they'd be willing to relocate to um, those schools, um, despite the impact maybe on, on the siblings or whether or not they would be willing to move in part. I can tell you that in uh, the brief period of time that this PowerPoint has been available to the public, um, members of the community have come out fairly strongly uh, <coughs> opposed to being moved. So I, I suspect that, that you know, folks tend not to like to get moved from their school. Mr. Virch and then Mrs. Johnson. I'm sorry, um, I wasn't finished. I just have one question. But, but so the fact is, is that they haven't been surveyed. No, they and haven't. they haven't been made aware that it is a potential that they could do a special permission transfer. So that's what I'm suggesting, that, that we do something at organized in informing the parents and also in soliciting their input instead of um, just relying on. And, and it, I had mentioned earlier, we'll look into that. Um, and to. the other question is, how does any of this help Ridgely Middle School? What is the plan for Ridgely Middle School? <clears throat> So at, at the start of the presentation, I, I mentioned that we were really pleased that the CE was uh, both funding a new middle school as well as an addition on Pine Grove. And we expect that the addition on Pine Grove will help with Ridgeway. So there'll be a redistricting along with the addition to Pine oh, Grove to move some yep. students and families out of Ridgeley Middle over to Pine Grove. That, we will have a redistricting process that allows for the balancing of enrollment across that region. Okay. Mr. Virch, and then Mrs. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, with regard to the annexing concept, I do want to thank Kelly McDaniel and Paul Harvey and Pam Fitzsimmons and Jessica Smith and Kate Zintars and Stephanie Wright and Matthew Barnes and Cheryl Patterson for all the input they've already given me about their feelings with regard to annexing. I do want to ask you this question. Uh, one of the parents who spoke tonight um, suggested parents voluntarily picking a school to attend, a uh, middle school to attend other than Perry Hall Middle School. I wanted to ask you uh, what, if any, um, uh, logistical uh, challenges that might present uh, if, in fact, that was allowed. So I would have to go back and review 5140 closely at this point uh, to see with whether or not the rule as written would support parents electing to move um, due to overcrowding within their, their building. Um, that being said, I think 5140 uh, speaks very clearly to some of the conditions that would preclude uh, a, a person moving. So. Uh, we certainly wouldn't want to see people using special permission transfers, for example, to try to move into Perry Hall at this point or move into Ridgely uh, because those buildings are already over capacity. So uh, there are some conditions that would preclude that. Dr. Brown, I appreciate you focusing on how the rule and the policy reads. My question, based on the parent's testimony, <coughs> was different. If someone is currently a, a Perry Hall middle school parent 
and they wanted to voluntarily say um, they would like their student to attend a different middle school because of the conditions at the school. My question was focused more on what, if any, logistical issues there might arise. Transportation is one that, that immediately comes to mind. There's staffing issues, et cetera, but I, I thought I'd best to defer to someone who has, a, has looked at the options with regard to overcrowding, including annexing. Are there any others that come to your mind? The first that, that comes as a logistic uh, challenge for that um, might have to do with staffing because I think staffing might be a little less predictable under that, that if one didn't know how many uh, students were moving from one building to another uh, in a timely fashion to, to manage staffing. Certainly transportation would, would be an issue that would need to be re uh, reviewed as well. Uh, but off the cuff, <coughs> at uh, spur of the moment, uh, those are the, the ones that come to mind. Thank you Mr. very much, Dr. Brown. Mr. Birch, I would also agree with Dr. Mm -hmm. Brown as well. Staffing would be um, really unpredictable in that uh, scenario. Also, the projections, um, at, as we make projections year over year um, to, to determine not only the uh, enrollment, but also looking at staffing, enrollment, professional development for teachers who are coming on new on board, thinking about um, the transportation, uh, the catchment area, and what that would look like. Uh, so that would uh, present a little bit of a challenge operationally for us, I would believe. Mrs. Johnson. So thank you. Um, you know, I had, hadn't heard about the annex annexing option until tonight, and uh, one of the, the parents out there mentioned the voluntary transfers, and I understand why that wouldn't be feasible right now. But the annexing, while I am Team BCPS all the way, I do feel like this just putting more trailers is kind of the easy way out. We've been hearing from Perry Hall parents meeting after meeting after meeting stating that their their school is over capacity and will continue to grow over capacity it would be a difficult process to ask some of the Kearney Oakley uh, and Kearney and Oakley elementary school students to go to Pine Grove and then the uh, Benson Farm to Middle River that would be a very I mean if this this conversation we just had with Cropper was was that intense I'm sure it would be that much more intense but we also have to look what the parents have been coming over and over and over to the board meeting and saying that they, it is not safe. Repeatedly, it's not safe at that school. So I think that annexing, while this is just for information, my information to you guys is that we do what's brave and what's what we need to do and get into the community and shift things around if we have to, because ultimately you said that Pine Grove will be at capacity by, if we do this shift, will be at capacity by 2021, but by that time we'll have the addition onto Pine Grove. Mm -hmm. So that capacity, I don't know if that's taken into account there. So um, again, my information, informational piece is that we, we get out there and we roll our sleeves up and we, we do a boundary change and or, and or an annex prior to 2021. Annex. Annex, thank <laughs> you. Last question or comment is Mrs. Miller. Thank you. Uh, you had mentioned Ridgely Middle relief for them. Um, what kind of time frame would we be looking at for that? Would we be expecting that the redistricting would be done in, at the same time as the addition for Pine Grove Middle in around 2021? Typically, we do the redistricting the year before. Um, and because we will have two, effectively, an addition and a new building, um, all the, the adjacencies will be involved in that process. It's, it'll be a large regional process to, to adjust the boundaries. So Ridgely Middle is looking at <coughs> relief around 2021. Mm -hmm. okay. That's on the same schedule. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Uh, next on our agenda is public comment on policies. The first policy is policy 8360, internal board operations. And the first speaker is Kathleen Rybarczyk. Good evening to the members of the board. I'm kind of going to just fire a straight shot across the bow um, on all the policies, which I had a very interesting time of going over on my lunch hours for the past couple of days. Um, the changes I saw on them were all very good. Um, they're needed. The updates, of course, are needed because there have been changes in Maryland state law, which we are obligated to follow. However, my main concern is, is that I have come to the board before to comment on things, and I always have to be very specific about which hat I have on that night, because I'm a BCPS employee, I'm a BCPS parent, 
I am a BCPS community member and a very major stakeholder because both my sons attend your schools. This creates something of a quandary for me. I've become more active in my union. I've become more active in the MSEA, the Maryland State Education Association. Um, and as I get more involved and as I was reading these policies over, I thought, I need some education about this. So what I would like to encourage you to do once you finish getting these policies rock bottom solid is offer your employees ethics classes, please. For those of us who are involved, especially as the midterm elections come up in our unions and in the MSEA and in the NEA and other national organizations that deal with education, please make sure we know where the lines are. It is vital so that we represent you well, we represent the school system well, and we represent the organizations we are involved with well. We want to make you look good, we want to advocate for education, and we need to do that in an ethical manner. Teach us how. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bosch Ferron. <coughs> Do them all in one, or I've, uh, I think it would be more efficient. Well, it's more efficient, but it's. Uh, I would love it if you don't you know, think that you're going to be like ten minutes or something. Um, I mean, although I'm entitled for eighteen minutes, but I wouldn't use it. Very I promise. Good. Very good. <laughs> okay. I know I stand between you and and board comments, but and I'll, I'll really try to be brief. The first policy is 8360, um, and, it, and this is really a question I, I just don't understand. In the first section where it says applicability, it really defines um, uh, members of the school board, superintendent, and employees. I wonder why not say just all employees and volunteers. There are probably some wisdom to the way it's done, but from my end, it's a question. Um, a second item under definition where a business entity does not <coughs> include a governmental entity. Um, and again, this shows my weakness. You know, I'm a surgeon, I'm not really a lawyer kind of a thing. And um, I mean, to me, why, why it doesn't include government entity? There must be a good reason, but I hope somebody would educate me about that. Um, and their compensation, money, or any other valuable thing. I think that's really great. Um, then under item F, uh, economic <coughs> value means a good that is useful and it is worth can be measured in financial terms. Um, again, I want to use this as an example. Again, I'm a practical person. Uh, for 22 years, the school system has closed on the Jewish holidays. To me, that means money, to me, means, means recognition, it means advertisement. And I look at this policy, and I really like it, but I wonder how does that apply to the Jewish holidays being closing and no recognition of Muslim holidays or Hindus or anything. Um, <coughs> Next one is uh, item L, it talks about immediate family. An immediate family means individual, individual spouse and dependent children. And comes to my mind what happens in, um, what's happening in national level and, and you know what happens if uh, the person has independent children, grown up children who have business and you know they are they are not really dependent and does that mean that they can be involved and this policy would not really affect them <coughs> uh, i hope you would check into that uh, i got the notion about 25 dollars which is good and that's my end of comments about 8360. can i go to the next one Keep rolling. We're going to, okay. you've got 10 minutes. 8361. Um, under item, uh, policy statement item B. Um, people have the rights to be assured that impartiality and independent 
judgment of public officials and employees would be maintained. I think that's really great, and I really applaud that definition. And then under item B, no ethics code can be delineated. In the bottom of that paragraph, it talks about an employee of the school system making a judgment in relation to ethics. Now, this really falls into what the previous speaker is saying. Um, so individual must rely on his or her good judgments. Now, I make judgment every day caring for people. That doesn't mean it is the right thing, you know, but you do your best. It's easy to know on Monday morning what, what people have done or should have done Saturday or Sunday. So um, I'm not really clear about this good judgment. It's, it's really vague. If there is some better way maybe by our lawyers that can define it a little bit better, because to me it's, it's <coughs> just really elastic in nature. And that's the end of my comment on 8361. 8362, uh, and their gifts to a school system, to a school official. A school official may not solicit any gifts. Um, I, I don't know exactly what that means. You know, what I'm thinking of sitting here, we really need money. So why not, for instance, you as a chair, you solicit a gift to Delaney High School to have air conditioners, gift by a corporation. I don't see something really wrong with that. Um, so, <coughs> you know, I'm not really sure of the phraseology to me. It is a good thing for officials to ask entities to donate to the school system. They do it in private schools, all right, and private schools gains a whole lot by that. And we in public schools, we are really quite restricted, and I think that can work against us. And in the last page, item number six talks about gifts from a person related by blood or marriage or any other individual who is a <coughs> member of the household. So gift from a person related by blood. Well, I mean, how far do we go related by blood? You know, my son obviously is my blood. My brother is my blood. But is my cousin my blood or second cousin or a third cousin? Um, it's just, you know, I think it needs to be looked at, especially by the lawyers in the committee. 8363, <coughs> uh, same idea about immediate family um, and their policy statement. I wonder whether it should be beyond immediate family. Uh, item participation, item number two, it talks about official has a direct financial interest of which the official may reasonably be expected to know. Uh, direct financial interest. So my question here is why not direct and indirect? You know, because indirect financial interests can be also profitable. Uh, direct that comes to my pocket, indirect comes in the form of some sort of favor that comes around a little bit. And that is still uh, inappropriate according to the policy, but it's not really written in here. That's the end of this policy. 8364, real quickly. Again, in this policy, it really talks about the superintendent, the cabinet members, the general counsel. I, I just wonder why breaking it down, if someone can educate me, maybe at a later time. Is it the Just keep, nope, no, no, you have 10, but you still have time. Oh, okay, thank you. Huh? No, just, you just keep going, just start at three. Okay, okay policy 8364. Oh. Excuse me. This policy is, I, I must admit, really beyond my uh, level, it's more complex, and I don't have any comment about it. The last one, 8365, um, I have one comment about it, and their lobbying, item A. 
communicating in the presence of a member of the school board or any school official with the intent to influence any official action of that member, et cetera. So my question here is with the intent. How do we know the intent of a person? Um, I mean, to me, that's vague. Um, a person could be um, not really um, too smart or savvy and be very obvious, or a, a person can be very shrewd and very experienced <coughs> and can hide that intent. And um, my question whether the word intent can be defined in a better way. I, I don't know how we really can know the intent of a person in an objective way. And that's the end of my comments. I really thank you for the 18 minutes. And thank, thank you, you Dr. Farron. Our next speaker is Marion Moore. So I noticed there are several definitions uh, in this policy that you will see throughout the entire uh, compilation of ethic policies. And um, what's very interesting about ethics is that, and law versus law, uh, with ethics, something that's ethical to me might be unethical to you and vice versa. It really depends on your personal beliefs or your maybe your prejudice or something like that. I recommend in policy 8360 that you add terms and definitions or yeah, the definitions of equity, discrimination, civil rights, <coughs> retaliation, and int intimidation. On page two of policy 8361, Letter B, you see terms such as fairness, equity, discrimination. Uh, there's also a term that says non-discrimination policy. Well, what does that mean? And should the community uh, or the board be responsible for explaining what that actually means? Since there isn't rules for the ethics policy, then I guess in, in the actual, there are not any rules, so we ha I guess you have to put more information in the policies to give examples of certain terms too, such as um, unconstitutional. You know what, I really think you should just have case studies, like the ethics review panel have case studies, and your case studies, uh, the, the board members' decisions, uh, review the decisions, did it have a fiscal impact on the school system based on the decision, did it have an impact on uh, your community or a certain demographic of your community <coughs> based on your decisions. Uh, so I think case studies are very helpful. And there's three questions of ethics that's very important. You ask yourself, is this illegal? Um, does it violate the professional or uh, the company's standards in terms of, for example, your policy 200? And um, is your decision harming others while benefiting uh, another set of uh, individuals? <coughs> I guess I'll just kind of stop there. Okay. Do, do I go to, do I just? It's just if you're done there, the next one you signed up for is 8361. Okay. Okay. All right, so in the standard section, num letter B, it says it's important. Therefore, whenever a difficult situation arises, which is not directly addressed by the ethics code, the individual seek counsel from colleagues, administrators, and the ethics review panel as established by the ethics code. However, many individuals will be called upon to make decisions in which time precludes consultations. In such cases, the individual must rely on his or her good judgment 
recalling the school system's ethical commitment is rooted in fairness, equity, and integrity. I recommend that I, I saw policy 200, but I didn't see policy 100 on a lot of the ethics uh, policies. So I suggest to add that. And then I also, I think that what's helpful, and, and I know uh, there was a, a, a young lady that mentioned about having ethics training. And something that's really cool is to integrate these policies with <coughs> all of your policies and those case studies that I mentioned about earlier. So there's some questions that you could ask yourself. And this is not just with your school system. It's just things that I've seen with other school systems as well. Is it ethical based on policy 5560 to give a black student harsher discipline for the same offense <coughs> of a white student? Is it ethical based on policy 5560 for a white male student resource officer to physically slam a black girl on the floor who is verbally disrespecting him? Is it ethical based on policy 5140 to dismiss an African American boy in good uh, academic standing in a majority white population and not address his parents' appeal when they are personal grievances listed in 5150 that will allow students to be enrolled in a particular school based on certain grievances? Is it ethical based on policy 5140 to allow a white boy or a white girl to keep his permission transfer when the school is overcrowded when he or she no longer meet all of the conditions of policy 5140? Is it ethical based on policy 300 and 8421 for board members to discriminate, intimidate, and retaliate against BCPS employees or former employees based on their ethnicity? Is it ethical based on policy 300 for a white employee to demonstrate racism through social media and create memes of their students and not receive the same punishment a black employee received when he or she says something related to race relations. Thank you. The next uh, policy you signed up to speak on is 8363. 8363 is conflict of interest. And what I wanted to bring up is the appeal process <coughs> for parents or students. Um, and especially for, from the standpoint of an African American point of view or community members who cannot afford legal representation uh, when their civil rights have been violated. So I do ask and recommend that in the legal references of your policies that you add, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. You may want to also add the Brown versus Board of Education case. Of course, the equity policy. Now, what I would like to uh, give uh, like a real, just a, a scenario in which policy 8340 appealed before the Board of Education as well as the policy 8341 appealed before a hearing examiner and what type of conflict of interest that um, can actually happen. And you know, what I've noticed that on a Board of Education there's several legal representatives and lawyers. So that could potentially be a conflict of interest when you select a panel uh, of lawyers that if you, if you uh, look in 8341, it says the board shall appoint a panel of at least five hearing uh, examiners annually. So is there a conflict of interest uh, there be because maybe some of the board members may know these hearing examiners and it can impact the decisions of the um, external hearing examiner? And then I like I would like to focus on the personal conflict of interest. Like if you have a particular prejudice and, um, and there's a, a parent who's really frustrated with the system and how their child has been treated, <coughs> and then all of a sudden, because they are so emotional based on the situation, you take it personally. And that articulates in your professional decision. That's a conflict of interest. That's a personal conflict of interest. But, I mean, you may not agree, um, but I agree with me. <laughs> and 
The it's last one that you signed up to speak on is 8364. Oh, I had 30 seconds left, but um, let's see. Ethics to me represent your natural instinct before you are taught what to believe, how to treat others, and how to lead. It represents your values, your morals, and more importantly, it should represent love. And so if we're leading for, with love, then that means that you would save more money each year <coughs> because a lot of people will be satisfied with your decisions as employees <coughs> and as board members. Just think about the time, energy, and resources that have been used in the past in education when we lead with hate, or we lead with prejudice, or we lead with discrimination. That energy and that time and taxpayers' money is unethical and it's unlawful. And so I think these are the type of things, even though it's tough, a tough conversation to have, but I take pleasure in having them with you. And honestly, sometimes I'm a little nervous about talking about them because I know people can take it personally. But I'm gonna be bold. I'm gonna be bold for my people. I'm gonna be bold for you because I know that if I pursue this and I know what's true in my heart, that is gonna help your jobs as well. <coughs> it's gonna help you lead differently compared to your former board members or you know former county executives that have been involved in this process of education. In closing, equity in education, economics in education, they just, they all relate, <coughs> they're, they're all interrelated. And I think we should just consider all things uh, in terms of how we relate to one another, treat each other and our families, and, um, and just leave from, for, leave from your heart, leave from your heart, not necessarily your prejudice. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on our agenda is item <coughs> P, and that's uh, committee updates. And I'll start with Mr. Yulfelder, the audit committee. Thank you. The uh, audit committee will meet next Wednesday at the time we will review their audit plan for 2018 and report back to the board uh, the results of our meeting. Very good. Uh, building and contracts, Mr. McDaniels. Nothing important to update. We'll meet at our next uh, board meeting day. Very good. Curriculum committee. Yes, um, I'll cover both of them, actually. The next curriculum committee meeting is Thursday, May 18th. The meeting is scheduled for 4.30 p.m. And then the next policy review committee is Wednesday, May 24th, scheduled for 4 p.m. Digital safety, Mrs. Miller. Yes, thank you. Um, <coughs> we met, uh, I don't have the date. Do you have that, Mr. Gillis? just a couple of weeks ago and I want to applaud the committee um, we have they have updated rule 6202 form a which is the parental opt-out of directory information and it really gives a lot more options to parents and I think that's a, a really positive move and I applaud the committee for that work um, it will go into effect on July 1st um, let's see, also there was a change to the way um, parents are going to be signing in to BCPS1, um, and I think that will also add a little security a layer <coughs> in there as well. <coughs> Excuse me. I have requested information on um, software to track device time and also a report on device breakage, loss replacement, and um, a report on adequate spare uh, devices in the schools. Our next meeting will be in June. Thanks. I thank you all for um, 
updating the rest of the board on the activities of those uh, committees. Next on our agenda is uh, agenda item Q, which is board member comments. We'll start with Mrs. Miller. Yes, thank you. Uh, I want to applaud the um, student teams from Eastern Tech and Carver who participated in the ACE Mentor Programs. That is a great program. ACE stands for Architecture, Construction, and Engineering. And uh, they had a competition. Um, Eastern Tech, they also handed out quite a bit of money in, in sponsor, I mean, in um, scholarships for seniors. And Eastern Tech, actually walked away with three of the six scholarships that were handed out uh, last week. So I applaud them for their efforts. Very good. Thank you. Mr. McDaniels. Thank you. Um, just very briefly, uh, Mr. Gillis mentioned earlier about the important work the board is doing with um, the interim superintendent search. Um, and at the same time, the board is in the process of looking at our uh, discipline and behavior policies, which I also think are very important work that the board is underway. Uh, is, uh, undertaking, and there were a number of uh, stakeholders and advisory groups that mentioned just this evening some uh, of the uh, challenges that we have with discipline and our special ed uh, population and others. So I wanted to encourage everyone to uh, submit comments related to those topics to the board at this time, either to the Board of Education address or to me directly. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Birch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my spouse. Two shows tomorrow. <laughs> uh, what Mr. Gillis is referring to is that he has seen me out and about. Um, I had the uh, real, the real pleasure to go to the Honestly Autism Day that uh, uh, our system uh, actively participated in. It was a tremendous <coughs> event. If any of my colleagues ever have the opportunity to go, I would recommend that you go again. Um, you'll not only get one of these uh, 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 wristbands uh, about autism awareness, but you may have the opportunity, as I did, to hear uh, autistic teen students from, our, from our, our BCPS schools talk about their experiences in the schools and how they see and, and hear things. And one fascinating student I listened to is not in our system, but uses a, a uh, device uh, with uh, word prompting to communicate. It was a tremendous experience. I'm glad that I, I went. Uh, Mr. <coughs> Gillis referred earlier to seeing me at the uh, Baltimore Museum of Art, uh, where Baltimore City and Baltimore County students' artwork was displayed, in some instances displayed on the same wall where weeks earlier a Matisse would have been hanging. And the proud parents who were able to come and see and show and have their picture taken, it's a great event if you ever get a chance to go. Uh, Oregon Ridge uh, had an event, uh, the Very Special Arts Festival. I went to it, and I, I encourage other folks to come uh, when it's held again. It's been going on, I understand, for, for years. And acceptance is really the watchword of the day. Uh, if you have a chance, there's a tremendous black box theater down at our Patapsco um, uh, High School, School for the Arts. I saw I Bet Your Life there, and uh, uh, the folks there took me up into the light and sound loft. They had me climb this ladder, not too dangerous, though, <laughs> and uh, had me sit at the control panel and kind of look at that and the 800-degree and 1,000-degree theater lights that uh, uh, really need to go LED, you know, in the 20th century, 21st century. And uh, I followed up with uh, board member June Eaton, and she's already on that. Uh, what an outstanding gay. Yeah, you got it. A uh, shout out to, to our, our June. And uh, I also was able to spend some time at our <coughs> Middlesex Elementary School. And also, I had a wonderful tour of our Martin Boulevard Elementary School. Um, both schools are two of the schools that are in our Victory Villa Boundary Study. Janet Mahoney and her staff could not have been nicer to me. I met the Teacher of the Year. You get a chance to come into our elementary schools. You really learn so much about our system. It's tough to get your arms around it, uh, but we hear so much from adults. It's good to be where kids are. And uh, uh, Kenwood, I think, has an art show coming. And um, our uh, Ginger Kane from the school at the Baltimore Museum of Art showed me around, sort of suggested what route I should take to view the art at the Baltimore Museum of Art. Anyway, those are my remarks. Thank you, Mr. Birch. Mrs. Johnson. Thank you. I just wanted to wish all the teachers, uh, oh. teacher, you can you want to go ahead. I have been asked by our vice chairperson to uh, recognize that today, uh, May uh, 9th, is Teacher Appreciation Day. It's Teacher Appreciation Week. We would be remiss 
if we didn't recognize the important, valuable contributions that our teachers at schools in addition to our very fine Seneca Elementary School, but for our teachers throughout our system and the role they have played and continue to play. I've taken words from our vice chairperson, but really they are with us through the rest of our lives. Very good, Mr. Burch. Thank you, Mr. Birch. Um, I guess I will echo what Mr. Birch just said, but thank you to all of our teachers that are watching or not or will catch up tomorrow. Um, it is a um, very honorable and noble job that you have every single day to, to, to create and cultivate the future <coughs> of, of the world that we live in. So I thank you, um, each teacher. I thank Ms. Baton. She had a great event. We were able to speak, uh, able to celebrate some, with some of the retiring teachers, some of the newbie teachers, um, the MVPs, and the ESPBC. Uh, community as well. So it was a great event last week and I also was able to attend um, the CTE Awards with Ms. White and uh, Mr. Handy and all the students throughout the county who just are doing amaz amazing things in career and technology and graduating with way th with degree or with certificates that I, I never even dreamed possible five or six years ago before I, before I was part of this board. So thank you. Mr. Dudelfoder. Thank you. Um, two things. Um, Yesterday, there was a press release uh, where the Washington Post in their annual rank ranking of high schools uh, rated 13 of our BCPS high schools in the top uh, 2,300 out of 22,000 across the country. And uh, it's just an amazing when over 50 percent of our high schools uh, are ranked among that, that number. Also, uh, and unfortunately, we won't be able to attend, but it was an interesting um, media advisory that came out uh, headed up symposium to showcase year-long independent research by BCPS high school students. And apparently this is the fifth annual student independent research symposium and it's conducted by 24 students from five BCS uh, high schools. And uh, they are going to present uh, their papers uh, on the 18th at 6 o'clock and I believe we have a hearing on the 18th at 6 o'clock. But j out of the 24, just let me, let me just read a couple of the topics. Gender discrimination in STEM fields. Why do students who love to learn hate school? Cultural influences on teenage male perception of homosexuality. And there's a lot of technical ones here. It's just incredible that, that we can have kids go a spend a year uh, doing this kind of, type of research. It just goes to show you the quality kids that we have in our system. Very good, thank you. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to say that I've really enjoyed uh, recently, the, as uh, Dr. Dance was saying, the end of the school year is a really special time when there's a lot of award ceremonies. And then, of course, our 10 days, the, the best 10 days of the school system are coming up with our graduations. Um, so I really enjoyed attending Pedonia International Elementary School's groundbreaking, uh, Pinewood Elementary School, their 50th school anniversary. Um, also, the Teacher and Principal Awards at Carver Arts Center. Um, also, uh, Dundalk has their own um, Commerce uh, Teacher Awards. Also, the Tabco ESPBC Retirement Dinner and the awards, and also the Wookie, Rookie, Rookie Teacher Recognition. Um, also, the Career Technology Education Awards uh, ceremony was just fantastic. Um, to these students, incredible students, and all these students expressed appreciation for their teachers. And one thing that's been really hit home is that the consistent theme in all of these events was love. And you'd think for a public school system, you know, that's not really necessarily what should be at the forefront. But the fact is that it was love. It's love for the students, these teachers that see the promise and potential of each child that they come in contact with. It's love for the families of the students as they try and do the best and work with some families that have some struggling and challenging circumstances. Also, the students that were involved in these reported the love that they have for their teachers, the support that they get from their colleagues, the mentoring that's experienced throughout the schools. So during this time when we are supposed to appreciate teachers, it is special to attend these <coughs> events and personally thank so many of them for all that they do for our children and the children uh, throughout the county. For those that I can't thank personally, I'm thanking you right now. I'm blessed and grateful to, to, to know you and to know that you're in the system. And all of these events solidify my confidence in Baltimore County Public Schools because we have thousands of dedicated, bright, creative, caring, hardworking teachers and support personnel, caring bus drivers, our nutrition staff, all of these folks. 
hundreds of experienced administrators with equally positive attributes, committed <coughs> parents and community members. So as we work on the transition to the interim superintendent, we should all be encouraged that the great efforts uh, to educate all of our students in Baltimore County Public Schools will continue. One area for improvement as we move ahead is the challenge of facilities. It's countywide, it's ongoing, it presents health and safety risks, it affects the ability to provide effective and equitable teaching and learning. The board needs to work to develop a comprehensive 10-year plan that encompasses all these facility issues, the overcrowding, ADA compliance, obsolete buildings, recreation and, and uh, athletic facilities, transportation and parking, not just reactionary, as was pointed out by one of our area advisory council chairs, but complete, including how much money we need to improve all the conditions at all the schools and then prioritize it in a systemic way, not a reactionary way. And while, uh, so I would encourage us to work on that. Uh, we have a board retreat coming up in July and hopefully we'll address that very important issue at that, at that event. As always, I value stakeholder and community input, so continue to feel free to send your thoughts, comments, and suggestions. All of our board emails are available on the website. I'm Kate Causey at bcps.org, and there's also boe at bcps.org uh, that can connect with all of us. Also, I just want to point out, while the interim superintendent search is underway, Mr. Ed Gillis is the official spokesperson for the Board of Education's work on this most important responsibility. Thank you, and have a good night. Mrs. Eaton. Thank you. I am all for the board approving money to all schools in need. No geographic area is without need of new schools or renovations. I do hope that Baltimore County Public Schools can secure money from the county and state. As a member of Team BCPS, I will do my part in advocating for and approving funds for those schools. <coughs> Thank you to all who came out tonight in support of their schools and their communities. Thank you, Ms. Eaton. Thank you each for your comments. Uh, there are a series of uh, information items at uh, tab R in your agenda and uh, the announcements at tab S. Uh, we've said it once or twice or three times. This will be number four, May 15 at 630 at Eastern Tech, a, uh, a boundary, a public hearing on boundary for Victory Villa Elementary School. Our next board meeting is Tuesday, May 23rd at 6.30 p.m.